Do I understand that you are testifying that the, the committee to re-elect the president and those associated with them constitute an eleemosynary institution that gave $450,000 to some burglars and their lawyers merely because they felt sorry for them? I'm afraid I'm not your best witness on that, Mr. Chairman. I don't know what their motives were. Uh, uh, well, I think those will, those will appear in the, uh, in the course of the proceedings. You stated this was a defense fund, just like that given to Angela Davis and to Daniel Ellsberg, didn't you? I stated that that was my understanding yeah. of it. In the Senate of the United States, a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons acting individually or in combination with others in the presidential election of 1972 or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel -gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening. The long-awaited John Ehrlichman appeared on Capitol Hill today to defend the Nixon White House and himself on a multitude of charges concerning Watergate. He claimed his own innocence of any cover-up activity, stood ready to refute all charges against him, and protested that the Irvin Committee needed a clearer view of what was really going on at the White House last summer. Watergate, as pictured by Ehrlichman, was merely a slightly embarrassing campaign issue which involved but a tiny part of the time of the President and his key aides, with many other matters on their minds. Only John Dean had time to mess with the details, and Ehrlichman added snidely, to plan the most expensive honeymoon in the history of the White House staff. The President, Ehrlichman said, was not paranoid or weird about demonstrators, but justly concerned with an unprecedented assault on crucial state secrets. Ehrlichman appeared combative and confident, and his cross-examination turned into a series of flare-ups, first with Counsel Sam Dash, and then with Chairman Sam Irvin. In one area, Ehrlichman appeared to go far beyond the President's own version, he claimed the break-in by Lydian Hunt of a psychiatrist's office searching for Daniel Ellsberg's medical records was legally justified under the President's powers to protect national security. That was hotly contested by Sam Irvin, brandishing a copy of the Constitution, who challenged Ehrlichman's lawyers to prove the point in law. That response and the rest of Ehrlichman's testimony promises to provide the most heated moments the committee has yet produced. Watergate prosecutor Archibald Cox went to court today to ask specifically for the White House documents he requires and that the White House says it will not surrender. Cox today extended his shopping list to nine tapes plus relevant documents involving the tapes and the Watergate. Yesterday, he had asked for only eight tapes. And at the White House itself today, the press office said that a Thursday morning deadline for replying to subpoenas would be met and that the president was involved in determining exactly what that response would be. The continuing friction between the Senate committee and the White House set off some additional sparks today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Republican National Chairman George Bush issued a statement charging that Republicans had been spied on in 1960. He said the surveillance had been ordered by the man who is now the chief investigator for the committee. Peter Kay has more on that story. In this lengthy statement, accompanied by three affidavits, Bush charged that the committee's chief investigator, Carmine Bellino, directed spying against Republican presidential candidate Richard Nixon in 1960. Specifically, Bush said telephones of three pro-Nixon ministers were tapped. He said that key Republican officials were shadowed, and most important, that surveillance produced information which Senator John F. Kennedy used in a critical television debate against Nixon. Bellino categorically and unequivocally denied ordering any electronic surveillance. He said Bush was falsely and maliciously trying to distract him from going on with one of the most important jobs of his life. The only thing on surveillance was a Republican former congressman who had set up a meeting of ministers in the Mayflower Hotel at which Dr. Norman Vincent Peale was the speaker and this, this Republican congressman was the one who participated in writing the speech for Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. We were interested in finding out 
where he would go when he came to Washington and whom he would contact. That was the surveillance. They lost him at the airport. What about uh, the Nixon-Kennedy debate? Was there any surveillance? No, absolutely never, never. Nothing that's a complete fabrication, a complete lie. Finally, a few personal observations. I was on the Nixon staff as a press aide in 1960, and I've reported politics ever since, and this is the first I've ever heard about any such charges. In the second place, the headquarters of the Nixon campaign in 1960 were not at the Wardman Park Hotel, as Mr. Bush says. They were in two buildings on 19th Street in northwest Washington. The official that was ordered shadowed, Ab Herman, worked for the Republican National Committee and really didn't have any major role in the Nixon campaign as far as I know then or now. Finally, as far as wrapping up the debates, during the first debate, the one that everybody thinks was critical, the one that everyone thinks Senator Kennedy won, Mr. Nixon was campaigning throughout the Midwest. The debate was held in Chicago, so I don't know how any surveillance in Washington would have affected the first debate. I say this not to refute Mr. Bush, but merely to add my puzzlement to what is already a very puzzling story. Haynes Johnson, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and editor with the Washington Post, sat with us during today's session. Haynes, uh, what would be your advice on what to look for in watching John Ehrlichman in action tonight? Well, Jim, there were several threads today. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman comes up here very poised to the hill, uh, gives a strong defense of the Nixon administration, including the president. The president is not paranoid, psychotic, he says. He tries to dispute the testimony of John Dean, the president's principal accuser, in derogatory terms, describes him at one, one point as uh, making statements falser than all the falsehoods, uh, a man who took the most expensive honeymoon in the history of the White House. And then as the testimony unfolds, in the interrogation, we get some very highly dramatic moments, particularly when Sam Irvin, the chairman of the committee engages in a long and emotional uh, interrogation about whether the president had the right to authorize illegal acts, specifically the burglary of the uh, Ellsberg uh, psychiatrist's office. And that's quite dramatic, one of the high points of the hearings to this date. All right, Haynes Johnson will be back at the close of tonight's broadcast to talk about today uh, in more detail. He'll be joined at that time by John Kramer of the Georgetown University Law Center. John Ehrlichman occupied the committee's entire day. To help you plan your watching, here is NPAC's regular schedule of what to look for. The former White House aide reads his opening statement in the first hour, saying he's appearing before the committee to refute every charge against him. And as the questioning begins, he tells how he gathered political intelligence for Richard Nixon in 1960 by serving as a driver in a Rockefeller motorcade in North Dakota. In the second hour, Ehrlichman discusses the Houston domestic intelligence plan and says it was never implemented because J. Edgar Hoover scuttled it. He says there was a special emphasis on the Pentagon Papers probe because there was suspicion those involved had ties to the Communist Party. Ehrlichman in the third hour says he suspected Jeb Magruder was involved in the Watergate incident soon after it occurred, and he says it was necessary to keep the existence of the White House plumbers quiet to avoid a recurrence of the massive leaks that had been detected within the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And in the final hour, Ehrlichman says he's morally certain that he never assured Herbert Kalmbach that raising money for the cover-up was legal and proper. On the same topic, he admits he made a tape of a telephone conversation in April, but did not tell Kalmbach he was being recorded. Senator Irvin is now ready to begin today's session. I couldn't get him. He wasn't in there. Said he had to return the call. Council will call the first witness. Will Mr. John Ehrlichman take the witness table? I see he has. Will you stand up? Yes, sir. Raise your right hand. You swear that the evidence that you should give to the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I suppose you will state your name and uh, address for the record. My name is John Ehrlichman. I live on Chesapeake Drive in Great Falls, Virginia. Now, I observe that you are have, uh, accompanied by counsel, and yes. I would request counsel to identify themselves for the purposes of the record. Mr. Chairman, my name is John J. Wilson. I'm accompanied by my younger partner, Mr. Frank H. Strickler, S-T-R-I-C-K-L-E-R. We both represent Mr. Ehrlich. Thank you very much. Mr. Ehrlichman, do you have a statement which you would like to read to the committee? 
Mr. Chairman, may I make a one-sentence preliminary remark, sir? Yes, sir. I just wanted to say that Mr. Ehrlichman is here pursuant to a subpoena, which I advised him to seek in order that we may protect ourselves with respect to things which may happen later on. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. The chair will find as a fact that Mr. Ehrlichman is here in obedience to a subpoena issued by the committee. Mr. Ehrlichman, do you have a statement you wish to read to the committee? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Read it, please. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, at the time of my resignation from the government, I assured the President that I intended to spend such time and personal resources as I had in the statement of the truth of these matters now before this committee. As I will describe, I have willingly and fully testified before several other official inquiries. Because I sincerely do not believe I am guilty of any wrongdoing, I have not invoked the Fifth Amendment, nor have I attempted to negotiate immunity for myself from anyone. A member of this committee, Senator Inouye, suggested by a question he asked a witness here that I had invoked executive privilege in some form and thereby had sought to avoid answering questions. Of course, only the President can invoke that privilege. On the occasion referred to, the President had established certain guidelines which are no longer in effect. Thus, I will try to fully answer all questions put to me by the committee within the new executive privilege guidelines. I welcome this opportunity to lay out the facts and publicly set the record straight on a number of questions. Some of these questions have been legitimately raised. Others are created by leaks to the press, falsehoods, and misunderstandings. I am here to refute every charge of illegal conduct on my part, which has been made during the course of these hearings, including the material leaked to the news media. What I say here will not be new, but it may be different from what you have been reading in the papers. I have testified fully before three grand juries, one in this city, one in New York, and one in Los Angeles. I have given my deposition in civil cases to which I am not a party. I have testified before other committees of the House and Senate. I have had an off-the-record, non-public meeting with the staff of this committee, and I have been interviewed by agents of the FBI on a number of occasions. In addition, on request of the staff of this committee, I have made available pertinent records in my possession, including transcripts of telephone conversations and meetings which I had with various people in the course of an inquiry which I conducted for the President. What I say here will not be different from my testimony and evidence in these other forums. Finally, in addition, when requested by the committee staff, I supplied my complete financial records and tax returns from January 1, 1969. I did this despite my attorney's advice that the scope and authority of this committee is limited to a study of the extent to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by persons, quote, in the presidential election of 1972 or any campaign canvass or any other activity related to it, close quote. Setting the record straight, I look forward to answering your questions concerning a broad range of subjects, including the following. Did John Dean investigate White House involvement in the Watergate break-in? What did he find? Is your Exhibit 39's description of those findings accurate? What was the so-called special unit concerned with the leaks and theft of defense and foreign affairs documents bearing secret and top-secret classifications? Why and how and when was the unit formed? What I know about the break-in attempt in California and its bearing on the Watergate, if any. Whether there is any real connection between the California break-in and the involvement of any White House employee in the Watergate cover-up. In that connection, whether the California break-in ever really could have been covered up in view of the authorities' actual knowledge or, alternatively, whether any cover-up was necessary in view of the national security aspects of the matter as legally determined by the President. Whether or not I knew the purposes to which the Kambach money was to be put, why and when I agreed to his fundraising, and what assurances I gave Mr. Kambach in July 1972. 
the story, or should I say stories, of the meeting to discuss Howard Hunt and the contents of Hunt's safe, and John Dean's effort to plant one of those stories with me about Hunt leaving the country. What I found out about the destruction of some of those documents from Hunt's safe, and more important, when I found out. The President's instructions to me regarding executive clemency and how I carried them out. The effort which I made to get a full public disclosure of the facts of this whole matter last summer and fall, 1972. The reasons for the meeting with the CIA director in June 1972 and what instructions were really given to the FBI as a result. Why I requested the Assistant Attorney General, Henry Peterson, to permit Secretary Stans to give testimony by deposition instead of at the grand jury. What I did when the President assigned the White House aspects of the Watergate problem to me on March 30th of this year. What various individuals told me in interviews why the President did not immediately fire John Dean, and why I taped some of the interviews and telephone conversations I have turned over to this committee and the grand jury. When I first learned of the Liddy intelligence meetings held early in 1972 and the other acts leading to the break-in at Watergate. When I first learned of the actions comprising the concealment of the truth about the break-ins. My working relationship to Mr. Dean his actual duties and mine, and his access to the President. What really happened and was said at La Costa in February, and why the President began meeting with Mr. Dean after that. The President's continued effort to obtain and publish a full, factual account of Watergate in its several aspects, and why he never got it. It has been repeatedly said that this is not a trial, that the committee will recommend legislation, not assess guilt or innocence. At the same time, the soundness and integrity of the President, his staff, and many close associates have been impugned and directly put an issue here. Many important questions about the White House, the presidency, and its staff system have also been asked here, but not answered. I hope and believe I can contribute a few of those answers, and also, perhaps, some measure of perspective. Mr. Dean began his statement with a somewhat superficial but gallery-pleasing repetition of the old story about fear and paranoia in the Nixon White House. Why, Mr. Dean wondered, was there all that overplayed concern about hippies coming to Washington to march peacefully down Pennsylvania Avenue? Mr. Dean's explanation is simply that we were all suffering from some advanced form of neurosis and nothing else, some strange White House madness. He suggests he was the only sane one in the bunch. Since he began his statement there, let me take up that subject briefly. I submit that on this general subject, there are some realities of governmental life to be weighed in your deliberations. From its first days, the Nixon administration sought a stable peace abroad and a return of our POWs from Southeast Asia. To get these results required the President to undertake foreign policy moves and initiatives which were completely interrelated and extremely delicate. In pursuit of this result, we necessarily gave earnest attention to the staffing of critical government positions with people loyal to the President's objectives and the problems of leaks, demonstrations, bombings and terrorism, public opinion, and congressional support were understandably on the President's mind. Today, the presidency is the only place in the nation where all the conflicting considerations of domestic and international politics, economics, and society merge. It's there that street violence and civil rights and relations with Russia and their effect on China and the Cambodian military situation and a thousand other factors and events are brought together on the surface of one desk and must be resolved. Some of these events in 1969 and 1970 included hundreds of bombings of public buildings in this country, a highly organized attempt to shut down the federal government, which you'll all remember intensive harassment of political candidates, and violent street demonstrations which endangered life and property. Taken as isolated incidents, these events were serious. 
taken as a part of an apparent campaign to force upon the President a foreign policy favorable to the North Vietnamese and their allies. These demonstrations were more than just garden variety exercise of the First Amendment. Just as and because they affected the President's ability to conduct foreign policy, they required the President's attention and concern. Had he and his staff been ignorant of the significance of such a campaign or merely indifferent, they would have been subject to that they, that is the president and his staff, would have been subject to the proper criticism of all citizens interested in securing a stable peace in Southeast Asia and the return of our POWs. But the president did understand these events to be important in the overall foreign policy picture, and they received balanced attention along with other events and factors. In 1969, when he first came into office, the President took this nation into a new international era in which the stakes were extremely high. From close observation, I can testify that the President is not paranoid, weird, psychotic on the subject of demonstrators, or hypersensitive to criticism. He is an able, tough, international politician, practical, complex, able to integrate many diverse elements and see the interrelationships of minute and apparently disassociated particles of information and events. Why didn't everyone know about Watergate? It's been my limited experience that in the trial of a long lawsuit with a great number of witnesses, it becomes hard for the lawyers, witnesses, judge, and jury to remember that anything else ever really happened in the community back at the time of the disputed event except that event itself, the collapse of a tunnel, the collision of the trains, or breach of the contract, in the case which is being tried in court, eventually appears to have occupied the very center of the stage at the time. I sense some of that shrinkage of perspective in some of the questions here and in some of the comments of the network people on television. Here's what appears to be this great big thing, a burglary, a cover-up horrors all going on, and witness after witness goes over the exquisite details of a few meetings, phone calls, memos, and conversations day after day here. One begins to think, surely all of this could not possibly have passed unseen by anyone of even average awareness. How then could people on the White House staff have failed to know all of these so obvious and often repeated and significant details? and failed to blow the whistle on the wrongdoers long before the ninth month. John Dean said one thing in his testimony, page 2929, falser than all the other falsehoods therein, when he said, the Watergate, quote, was probably the major thing that was occurring at this point of time, meaning in the context of Senator Baker's question in the White House between June 17 and September 15, 1972. To demonstrate the absurdity of that important misstatement, I need only briefly develop a few facts which are perhaps a broader view of the months following June 17, 1972 than Mr. Dean is willing to take for his purposes. To this end, I would like briefly to describe the White House, my experience there, and say a few things about the presidency in order to make more understandable some of the questions before you, including access to the president, Mr. Dean's role, and who reported to whom. And you need a clearer picture than you've had so far of what was really going on at the White House in June 1972 and the following months. I do not suggest that we were all just too busy to have noticed. We did notice, and we kept informed through John Dean, among other sources, on the assumption that he was giving us complete and accurate information. But it is important to know that in today's White House, there must be, and there is, a heavy delegation of responsibility and duties. This narrative goes to the question, how could all this have been avoided? And it goes to the important point that a chain of delegation is only as strong as its weakest link. White House Council, 1969 to 70. I came to the White House as counsel to the President from a private civil law practice in Seattle, Washington. I took a substantial financial cut to come into the government. I came because the President asked me to, 
and because I became convinced that there was an opportunity to really accomplish things for the country by assisting him. My wife and family made the greatest sacrifice, of course. Their lives were totally disrupted in moving here. I worked long hours and every day, and they were asked to make new lives around that schedule. For us, the only real compensation for all of this was a great sense of accomplishment as we saw the President's ideas begin to take hold and his goals begin to be achieved. In my view, all this talk of White House staff power and status is meaningless currency which cannot possibly pay for one's lost time with his family and the lost freedom to live one's own life. Because I once was counsel to the President, I know what the President has delegated to the one who holds that post, specifically, in this case, John Dean. Aside from being the President's liaison to the departments and agencies concerned with legal matters, the counsel to the President is supposed to be the conscience of the White House. It is his job to keep a sharp eye out for wrongdoing, such as potential conflicts of interest, to ensure that presidential appointees cannot put personal interest ahead of the interest of the public in governmental matters. He reviews the FBI checks of all potential presidential appointees for just such problems. He keeps abreast of legal and other questions which are before the executive branch to be able to answer questions when asked by the president or his staff. He reviews documents before they go to the president for signing. In addition, he is a conduit for all kinds of miscellaneous information relating to federal law, and regulatory agencies, legal technicalities, and legislation. It is his job to keep the White House informed of a whole raft of subjects within these general areas. And perhaps most important, he must be a self-starter. He must take the initiative, because in the Nixon White House, there is no one else who is going to have the time to supervise, make assignments, decide what should be looked into. Everyone else is fully occupied with his own area of responsibility. Thus, the Council is a vital link in a chain of delegation. In my view, one in that position must bring to the job sufficient training and experience to know what to do and when to do it. The Council also has and has had political duties. The President is the nation's chief executive, but he is also, by longstanding tradition, his political party's leader. Any President has a political role to play, whether he's going to run for re-election or not. But if he is a candidate, then he is both an executive and a practicing politician. Every such politician wants information. And the President, in his politician role, is no different from the others. He needs and wants information about issues, supporters, opponents, and every other political subject known to man. For the year 1969 to 1970, when I left the post of counsel, I attempted to gather some purely political information for the President, as I was expected to do. Out of real concern for the proprieties, I attempted to use only conventional, non-governmental sources of information as one might hire political aides in a political campaign. Tony Ulasiewicz was hired to do this chore of information gathering. He was paid from existing Nixon political money by check under an appropriate employer's tax number. Among other assignments, he scouted the potential opposition for vulnerability. So far as I'm aware, during my tenure as counsel, Mr. Ulasiewicz conducted his assignments legally and properly in all respects. The Office of the President. To meaningfully, to meaningfully begin to answer the question, what did the President know, one should have a clearer picture of what the President really does. One witness here suggested that we define the presidency in constitutional terms. But the true up-to-date picture will not alone be found in the pages of the Constitution, nor even in the modern textbooks on civics and government. Obviously, he is the chief executive responsible for the administration and operation of the departments and agencies and bureaus and offices of the executive branch with their millions of employees and billions of dollars of spending. And of course, his duties include the conduct of the nation's foreign policy in a troubled world. He's commander in chief of the armed forces, frequently works with the Joint Chiefs of Staff on a personal basis, sits with the National Security Council and the military intelligence gatherers for hours at a time, makes the decisions on defense strategy, and is responsible for its long-range planning. 
He must also submit the nation's multi-billion dollar budget to the Congress every January, covering every activity of the federal government in great detail. That is sheer month-by-month -month drudgery for the President, involving decisions that really cannot be delegated to anyone else, and work that is never really done. All of this is known to most citizens and surely to the distinguished senators of this committee. I'm sure you also realize the presidency has been dramatically changed in recent years by the increasing complexity of the nation's foreign and domestic problems, a domestic issue which simply could be considered and resolved by one agency head in 1935 or 1940 without involving the White House, today probably involves the conflicting interests of two or three major departments of the federal government and frequently results in disputes which only the White House can resolve. For example, five or six departments today are directly concerned with important aspects of the subject of health, consumers' interests, narcotics and drug abuse, Indian affairs, and the creation of more parks, for instance, all involve two or more departments. These subjects are more complex because the nation, the society is, and government is larger and more complex. There are 1,400 categorical grant programs administered by the executive branch today compared to a third that many 20 years ago. Our nation's concept of government's role has changed, and with it, the presidency has changed qualitatively and in terms of the workload. As this dimension and complexity has compounded, the demands and claims for the president's personal time and attention and his personal decision have steadily escalated. Jurisdictional conflicts between cabinet officers, departments, levels of government all now find their way to the White House by some law of governmental gravity. I find in conversation that some longtime Washingtonians who have been here many years still do not have a true, realistic understanding of the quality and quantity of the demands upon a president's time, nor of the fact that they continue to escalate with every day that passes. And so, the President must have some help. He has a staff. He must have some system for delegating and for determining which of all these claims deserve and require his time on a priority basis. For example, there's been some surprise expressed here that Mr. Dean, his counsel, did not have easy entry to the President's office to drop in to discuss the counsel's concerns. The fact is, that with a senior staff of about 20 and a total staff of over 400, and given the real demands on his time, the President necessarily must operate on the basis that his staff comes to him when called only, and all others did business on paper. This last is a very important point, however. Men and women, even those considerably junior to Mr. Dean on the staff, frequently avail themselves of access to the President's evening reading via the typewritten page. Important papers invariably got a full and quick response. Mr. Haldeman, Dr. Kissinger, and the rest of us seldom, if ever, saw the President unless he called for us. On the other hand, my staff and I had quick and easy access to the President's attention whenever there was a need, simply by sending in a memorandum or message, asking for a decision or an appointment or calling his attention to facts or events. For example, Mr. Dean admits he informed the President even hourly of some occurrences in this way. It was an open channel, and he knows it. The President necessarily delegates responsibility to his staff. I've described, for example, a delegation to the Council. Some problems must be handled only at the White House, but need not be handled by the President himself. And in my view, these subjects are properly delegated to the White House people to act in the President's place. It would be impossible for the President or any one person in his behalf to keep informed of everything being done by the staff, even in areas of major current interest or concern. Before I leave this matter of access to the President, I should add also that in my experience, any member of the White House staff having vital or sensitive information for the President alone could and would be seen by the President if he requested an opportunity. I know of a number of instances in which such a need was met during my time at the White House. Assistant to the President. 
In early 1970, my job had changed. I left the Council's office and became one of the several assistants to the President. My assignment was domestic affairs, and those of us working in that area were given the job of bringing to the President those domestic presidential decisions which required his attention, along with as much information, advice, and opinion as we could gather from all sources to enable him to consider an issue broadly. We were the liaison between the President and the departments and agencies dealing with the entire range of domestic problems as well. The President follows the news of the day closely and constantly communicates with these departments and agencies concerning the problems they currently face. This is done usually through the responsible White House staff person whose assignment includes the subject matter of the department or age or the excuse me includes the subject matter or the department or agency involved. The president has sent between 20 and 50 domestic legislative packages to the Congress in each year of his terms. They ranged very broadly in subject matter. This legislation was usually the product of many meetings, countless drafts and redrafts, and the active participation of the president, his staff, the Office of Management and Budget, and the departments having jurisdiction of the subject matter. As you know, the federal budget is also an instrument of policy. Next year's budget begins in preparation the day after this year's goes to the Congress. All through the spring and summer months, the budget decisions are framed and moved to the President for action. In September 1972, for example, the President formulated his budget strategy for the months January to March 1973. In the fall, the final marks are given to the departments, and then the President considers specific appeals from the Cabinet members or agency heads who feel they have been shortchanged. Throughout this process, the assistants for our national security affairs, affairs and domestic affairs must work closely with the President and the Director of the Budget on the minutest details. And then there is the Congress. The legislative packages, the budget, and countless other decisions which ultimately rest with the Congress are affected by the devotion of time and attention which the President can give to their explanation and his advocacy with individual members and groups of members. A president could, I am sure, devote every waking moment to this work and still not satisfy every demand or criticism. I've not even mentioned the president's necessary role in the area of foreign and domestic economic problems, problems of inflation, balance of payments, the relative values of currencies, import and export restrictions, the level of federal spending and unemployment, all through the my log and the, and the calendar, you will see meeting after meeting devoted to the problem of rising food prices, for instance. He must work closely with his Council of Economic Advisors, the four departments principally involved with these problems and with the key committees of the Congress on an increasingly frequent basis. As I worked within this setting, of course, my time was simply not my own. Issues were forced upon us by their progress in the Congress, by budget deadlines, by the expiration dates of existing laws or continuing resolutions. And my subject for the day was frequently determined by something assigned by the President when I got to work that day. As liaison to the domestic operating departments and agencies, I frequently carried to them the President's expressions of criticism and suggestions for change. To the uninformed, this undoubtedly would appear to create tensions between a cabinet secretary and me. But actually, I think I maintained a good and frequent contact and good relations with our domestic secretaries, including the several attorneys general over my three years in this position. I confess I did not always bring them good news, but then that wasn't my job. They and I shared a mutual objective, I think, and that was to do all we could to help the President accomplish his stated goals. As many here know, not everyone in the executive branch in the first term shared these goals. There were a number of holdovers in the executive branch who actively opposed the President's policies, especially his foreign policy, but also in the area of domestic affairs, I can assure you. These people conducted a kind of internal guerrilla warfare against the President during the first term, trying to frustrate his goals by unauthorized leaks of part of the facts of a story, or of military and other secrets, or by just plain falsehood. The object was to create hostility in the Congress and abroad and to affect public opinion. 
Henry Kissinger, Secretary Rogers, and others were seriously concerned that this kind of internal sabotage of administration policy could actually ruin our chances to negotiate a strategic arms limitation treaty or terminate the Vietnam situation on a stable basis, for example. A similar threat to a good result in Vietnam was posed by the combination of street demonstrations, terrorism violence, and their effect on public and congressional support for the President's policy. The President and Politics. In his 1960 campaign, Mr. Nixon was involved in every minute detail. In 1968, when he invited me to work in the 68 campaign as the manager of the campaign tour, I agreed to manage the tour only after securing his promise that he would completely delegate detailed control of the advance work, logistics, and schedule. And his participation in these details was minimal in 1968. In 1972, with the foreign situation as it was, the President decided quite early that he simply could not and would not involve himself in the day-to-day -day details of the presidential primaries, the convention, and the campaign. He made a very deliberate effort to detach himself from the day-to-day -day strategic and tactical problems. And so the regular work of the White House relating to government and the nation's problems continued unabated. If anything, we on the domestic side were busier with the President on governmental business than in other years. In 1972, the President had to delegate most of his political role, and it went to people not otherwise burdened with governmental duties. As a result, I personally saw very little of the campaign activity during the spring and early summer of 1972. The President asked me to be sure that the campaign organization and the National Committee said or did nothing inconsistent with administration policy. And so I had a few meetings with the CRP people to explain existing domestic policy, that is, on campaign issues. Dr. Edward Harper of our staff established liaison on a regular basis to review pamphlets, position papers, and research, and we worked with the White House writers on a series of substantive statements and speeches which the President delivered during the campaign on subjects like welfare, amnesty, education, busing, and so forth. I began to spend more time with Ron Ziegler, the press secretary at the White House, in the late spring of 1972, helping him to understand the campaign issues reviewing the research with him, etc., became more important than ever for me to keep ahead of developments. And in this connection, I asked Mr. Dean to inform me as early as possible of significant changes or new events in the Watergate case so Ron Ziegler and I could deal with new issues which would be arising in the press. It was for this purpose that I talked to Dean about Watergate in most instances. In addition, the President formed an advisory group which met twice a week to look at the campaign in overview at, at long range and to discuss any needed changes. Attending these Monday and Thursday morning meetings were Clark McGregor, John Mitchell, Bob Haldeman, Bryce Harlow, Charles Colson and I. Presumably I was the substantive issue man in the group. Since Watergate was a campaign issue, it was discussed in these meetings. It was never a major subject of discussion, however, and if anyone in the group knew more than the others, he didn't share his secrets there. I also represented the President during the platform committee deliberations at the Republican Convention. Dr. Harper and I invested many, many hours in the platform issues in the weeks prior to the convention, and our labors only ceased when the convention voted its adoption with a few acceptable amendments. Thereafter, I traveled with the President on his campaign trips to assist in handling last-minute issue questions in speeches, etc. Nothing more important. All of this was superimposed upon active involvement in legislative, budget, and operational domestic problems through the summer and early fall of 1972. During the summer and fall of 1972, there were tough legislative issues, which took the President's time and ours in great quantities. Busing, water quality, phase two of the economic program, and welfare reform are, I know, subjects familiar to you all. They were critical issues to the Senate, as they were to the President. Federal government overspending was also a hot issue, and we were engaged in documenting a catalog of bad federal spending programs to justify the congressional repeal or reduction of a great many programs that spent great sums of federal money with little or no benefit to the public. 
During those months, along with a great many others, we were trying to understand Senator McGovern's $1,000 a year welfare plan and figure out its true cost. And we were researching and analyzing about 20 other major campaign issues, ranging from tax reform to the death penalty. These issues were being framed between the two candidates as the campaign went on. We were checking into the propriety of the grain sales for export, which had been challenged. The President negotiated with the new Japanese Prime Minister for two days in Hawaii in September. I made that trip with him and had a number of meetings there in my fields of responsibility. Other pressing issues the President and the White House staff were at work on, the presidential campaign aside, included air hijacking, a ceiling on federal spending, post office problems, unemployment, surface transportation, government property disposal, the revision of the system for classification of secret documents, environmental problems such as clean air, water, pesticides, grazing, flood damage rehabilitation, and countless other issues. As my log will show, I spent considerable time every week with the press, attempting to explain and outline for the media the President's domestic goals and programs. From June to September 1972, my staff and I put in long days, the convention platform having imposed additional burdens on some of us. After the convention, the speeches, position papers, and political statements and releases kept the pressure on us. It was a very busy time. John Dean, on the other hand, never found things so quiet, and he planned the most expensive honeymoon in the history of the White House staff right along in this period of time. I do not write many memoranda. Most of my staff communication in the White House took place in person or on the telephone. And my work pattern was such that I ordinarily took direct phone calls only from those with whom I shared direct phone lines. The President, George Schultz, Ken Cole, Bob Haldeman, and Casper Weinberger. The committee has had the log of how I spent my office time over the years. As it shows, the vast percentage of my time was devoted to domestic policy issues. Great blocks of time were consumed by a single problem or issue. Literally half of November and half of December 1972 were devoted to the President's reorganization of the executive branch and many personnel changes. Much of the impounding and budget cut and veto strategy unveiled by the President in January 1973 was also developed in those two months as a result of decisions made by the President in a series of long sessions in September, October, and November 1972. I have attempted in this statement to show you the personal context in which I worked in the White House during the last three years. I had heavy duties and a rather specific area of concern. I was not a generalist once I ceased being counsel to the President in 1970. Nor was I anyone Siamese twin during those years. Listening to the star witness here hyphenate me for five days, I began to know a little of how a caboose feels. I began to know uh, Mr. Dean repeatedly and facilely would, would testify. And, and he would say, and so I informed Haldeman hyphen and hyphen Ehrlichman of so-and-so, as if that were possible to do with one phone call or drop by. It could not really happen. And in virtually every case to which he referred in testimony, it did not happen. And how much time did I actually spend with Mr. Dean learning about the break-in or keeping abreast of developments to assist Ron Ziegler on the issues, or with Mr. Dean on any other subject, for that matter, in the weeks following Watergate? Dean and I invariably met either in my office or much more rarely in Mr. Haldeman's, with the exception of just three or four meetings, most of which were held out of town. The logs for these two offices, Mr. Haldeman's and mine, demonstrate clearly the frequency of my meetings with Mr. Dean. Remember, <coughs> pardon me. Remember, Dean testified that keeping Watergate covered up was a tremendous drain of my time and told all of, the of all the conferences and meetings I was having with him about it. Let's be clear. I did not cover up anything to do with Watergate nor were Mr. Dean and I keeping steady company during all those weeks. I have compiled our meetings in two-week periods from June 17 through the election, the critical period, presumably. 
And here on page 27 of the statement, Mr. Chairman, you will see that compilation. In the first two weeks, June 17 to July 1st, which was the period when we were trying to learn about this new campaign issue and whether the White House, the CIA, or anyone else were connected with it, I had nine meetings with Mr. Dean. In the second two weeks, I had only one meeting. In the third two weeks, three. In the fourth two weeks, two. In the fifth two weeks, one. In the sixth two weeks, two. In the seventh two weeks, September 13 to 26, none. In the eighth two weeks, one. In the ninth two weeks, again, none. And finally, from October 25th to Election Day, three, for a total of 22. It should be noted that this is the total number of our face-to-face -face contacts on all subjects, not just Watergate. These were all contacts, including group meetings. Of the total of 22 contacts, I can reconstruct that at least two related to presidential papers and testamentary planning. One related to convention planning, one related to grain sales, two on general campaign planning, one regarding the president's financial statement to be released, one regarding settlement of the common cause lawsuit. Of the remainder, not all were devoted to talk about aspects of Watergate, I'm certain. Now again, on this Siamese twin business, Mr. Haldeman and I had vastly different duties, areas, and methods of operation. On many occasions, he would be away when I was in the office, and many days he was there and I was gone. He invariably traveled with the president. I did not. I had a separate travel schedule. I did many things with and for the president, especially in the legislative and policy area, of which Mr. Haldeman was not aware. Similarly, I had very little knowledge of what he was doing day by day. I had a number of talks with Mr. Dean about Watergate, largely to keep posted on the campaign issue, which I never had occasion to mention to Mr. Haldeman, but about which I talked to others, Mr. Ziegler, for example. I simply want to make the point, without overdrawing it, that Mr. Haldeman and I live very separate lives and careers in and out of the office, Mr. Dean to the contrary notwithstanding. <clears throat> the vast percentage of my working time was spent on substantive issues and domestic policy. About one half of one percent was spent on politics, the campaign, and the events with which you have been concerning yourselves as a committee. That is the context in which I hope you will receive this testimony. Similarly, you must measure the President's role in all of this in true perspective. The 1972 campaign, the Watergate and its investigation, competed for his attention with the claims of hundreds of members of Congress, economists, diplomats, educators, scientists, labor leaders, businessmen, and countless other citizens, and with the demands of the problems of the nation in their manifold and compound complexities. With the Daily Mail, and the endless meetings, the speeches, and other communication with the public, with the need for management, leadership, and inspiration, and the need and desire for time to study and think. I see redeeming aspects in this process. I have faith that good can result from this committee's efforts. In the future, participants in political campaigns will surely be aware of the history of this time and the standards which they will wish to impose upon themselves will be the products of the lessons of that history, whatever it may turn out to be. I have great optimism that the lessons of the history of this era will bring only good for this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Ehrlichman has aggressively laid out his defense to a variety of charges. In a moment, Chief Counsel Sam Dash will examine him. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will resume after a brief pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we go back to the hearings, John Ehrlichman is about to be questioned about his White House duties, including his relationship with the so-called plumber's unit. Mr. Ehrlichman, I think you've indicated in your statement a extreme loyalty to the president and the position that you held first as counsel to the president and then as, as a special assistant to the president in domestic uh, affairs. Can you tell us, tell the committee, when did you first begin to work with President Nixon in any political campaign? Uh, late in 1959, Mr. Dash. And can you tell us what role you played? Yes, I was an advance man in the 1960 campaign. How did you obtain this assignment? Uh, through Bob Holloman, who was uh, uh, the um, uh, campaign tour manager in that campaign. Could you tell the committee how you knew Mr. Holloman at that time? Yes, we'd been at the university together. I, I would take it then you were very close friends. Uh, not terribly close friends in college. Um, we kept track of one another uh, casually over the years. And um, I was uh, a guest at his home in Connecticut during a trip east in 1959, and he asked me if I'd be interested in taking a leave from my practice and, and uh, working in a political campaign. Uh, then is it it's true, then, that prior to that time, you were in private practice of law? Yes. Where, where was that, Mr. In Seattle. And what, what branch or uh, area of the law did you specialize in? Well, at first I uh, did trial work for uh, five or six years, and then my practice narrowed and I began to uh, specialize in the problems of, of real estate and land use. And uh, toward the, the latter part of my practice, before I uh, uh, left private practice and came here, uh, I was uh, largely dealing with uh, uh, either environmental problems or problems of land use. Now, Mr. Ehrlichman, during the time, uh, during the 1960 campaign, when you were working with uh, uh, Mr. Haldeman and also for President Nixon as an advance man, uh, is it true that you were serving to some extent as an undercover agent uh, sort of uh, st stalking Mr. Rockefeller, as it has been st once stated. No, that was a that was a prior episode. Um, during the during the primaries in the pre-convention period of that uh, uh, 1960 campaign, uh, Mr. Finch, who then was uh, on the vice president's staff, uh, President Nixon then being vice president, asked me if I would go to North Dakota and uh, observe uh, uh, Governor Rockefeller's efforts to um, rejuvenate a then-abandoned uh, presidential aspiration. Uh, as he had, he had been running, he decided not to, he decided to get back in, and he was making a tour of the Midwest to see if he could pick up some convention delegates. So I went there for that purpose. And, and what role did you uh, play when you went to um, North, was North Dakota, I think? Well, other than being a driver in Governor Rockefeller's motorcade, I was simply an observer. How did you obtain that uh, position as a driver in his motorcade? Through mutual friends. What? I take it that um, uh, you were considered part of Mr. Rockefeller's uh, entourage. Well, I don't imagine that it really occurred to anybody to ask. No. And who were you reporting to at that time? Mr. Finch. Now, in the 68 campaign, did you uh, play any role in the political campaign? I was the, the tour director. And what, what uh, function well, did, that's did the tour largely, director have? That, it's largely uh, uh, dealing with problems of scheduling, advancing, and logistics, and the care and feeding of the press. Care and feeding of the press. Now, when Mr. Nixon was elected president, uh, 
You joined the White House staff first as counsel to the President. That's correct. When did you move from that position to the position of assistant to the President for domestic affairs? It was near the beginning of 1970. I, I can't recall the exact date, but in the first couple of months of 1970, I believe. Now, at that time, what was Mr. Haldeman's position? I think he held the same position throughout the first term. And that so, was the st staff director? Yes. And again, I take it you were working closely with your former colleague, Mr. Haldeman, uh, in this position? Well, less closely as assistant to the president for domestic affairs than I had as counsel. What was your official working relationship then with Mr. Haldeman as uh, assistant to the council? Assistant to the president? The president, yes. Uh, I, had a, I had an area of responsibility in which I was uh, uh, pretty autonomous in the sense that uh, uh, I could, I could um, e either select staff or delegate the selection of staff to my deputy. Um, as it developed, we had our, a separate budget so that our budget was not worked around through the White House budget, which Mr. Haldeman had responsibility for. And um, uh, my responsibilities were uh, on a direct line to the President rather than uh, as previously through Mr. Haldeman. Uh, but did you consider Mr. Haldeman as senior to you in the White House staff? Well, I don't think anybody on the White House ever considers anybody else senior to him. Uh, uh, the, uh, I, I take it other than the, uh, the president. Uh, the, right. Uh, well, uh, it's a it's a uh, sort of a metaphysical concept among the assistants to the president, and uh, as to who is senior to whom. Uh, my reporting relationship, so to speak, uh, was direct to the president at that point, and uh, only on. Uh,
one statement. No, that was a that was a prior episode. Um, during the during the primaries in the pre-convention period of that uh, uh, 1960 campaign, uh, Mr. Finch, who then was uh, on the vice president's staff, uh, President Nixon then being vice president, asked me if I would go to North Dakota and uh, observe uh, uh, Governor Rockefeller's efforts to um, rejuvenate a then abandoned uh, presidential aspiration. Uh, as he had, he had been running, he decided not to, he decided to get back in and he was making a tour of the Midwest to see if he could pick up some convention delegates. So I went there for that purpose. And, and what role did you uh, play when you went to uh, North, North Dakota? Well, other than being a driver in Governor Rockefeller's motorcade, I was simply an observer. How did you obtain that uh, position as a driver in his motorcade? Through mutual friends. Uh, what? I take it that um, uh, you were considered part of Mr. Rockefeller's uh, entourage. Well, I don't imagine that it really occurred to anybody to ask. Yeah. And who were you reporting to at that time? Mr. Finch. Now, in the 68 campaign, did you uh, play any role in the political campaign? I was the, the tour director. And what, what uh, function well, did, that's did the tour largely, director have? That, it's largely uh, uh, dealing with problems of scheduling, advancing, and logistics, and the care and feeding of the press. Care and feeding of the press. Now, when Mr. Nixon was elected president, uh, you joined the White House staff first as counsel to the president. That's correct. When did you move from that position to the position of assistant to the president for domestic affairs? It was near the beginning of 1970. I, I can't recall the exact date, but in the first couple of months of 1970, I believe. Now, at that time, what was Mr. Haldeman's position? I think he held the same position throughout the first term. And that so, was the st as staff director? Yes. And again, I take it you were working closely with your former colleague, Mr. Haldeman, uh, in this position? Well, less closely as assistant to the president for domestic affa affairs than I had as counsel. What was your official working relationship then with Mr. Haldeman as uh, assistant to the counsel? Assistant to the president? The president, yes. Uh, I, had a, I had an area of responsibility in which I was um, uh, pretty autonomous in the sense that uh, uh, I could, I could um, e either select staff or delegate the selection of staff to my deputy. Um, uh, as it developed, we had our, a separate budget so that our budget was not worked around through the White House budget, which Mr. Haldeman had responsibility for. And um, uh, my responsibilities were uh, on a direct line to the president rather than uh, as previously through Mr. Haldeman. Uh, but did you consider Mr. Haldeman a senior to you in the White House staff? Well, I don't think anybody on the White House ever considers anybody else senior to him. Uh, uh, the, I, uh, I take it other than the, uh, the president. Uh, the, right. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, it's a... It's a uh, sort of a metaphysical concept among the assistants to the president and uh, as to who is senior to whom. Uh, my reporting relationship, so to speak, uh, was direct to the president at that point and uh, only on uh, in a limited number of cases uh, did I come under Mr. Haldeman's um, area of interest, so to speak. Well, but since you had the earlier working relationship, and I take it also a friendly relationship with Mr. Haldeman, would it not be true that quite apart from whatever chart uh, hierarchy that would show that you did have a relationship with Mr. Haldeman in which you would discuss matters and uh, communicate with each other? Oh, certainly, certainly. And I take it that if you knew of anything of importance that he should know, you let him know about it. Well, we had a we had a kind of a clearinghouse meeting every morning of the senior staff in the White House, and that was for the purpose of tabling 
anything that, that others needed to know of a, of a business nature. We tried to have that meeting early enough in the morning so that before the President uh, opened business, so to speak, uh, uh, we had all of those things in the mutual knowledge and understanding of everybody in the group. And that was a group, uh, uh, well, actually, there were two of those meetings, one a large meeting uh, and, and then one uh, of uh, anywhere from five to eight senior staff people. And your knowledge of Mr. Haldeman, certainly over the years, and especially when you worked with him in the White House, uh, to your knowledge, was he a person who uh, was a well-organized person and also a person who wanted to know all the facts? Well, he was certainly well-organized. I, I think he has the ability not to want to know all the facts, which is one of the big problems in sifting out what you need to know from what just wastes your time. And uh, I think uh, he had developed a, uh, an ability to discriminate what was important from what wasn't important. Uh, well, then he certainly wanted to know what was important. I think that's fair to say. Now, what was, what was your official and working relationship with Mr. John Dean during the period, say, from January 1972, uh, actually, although until you left the White House? Well, um, in point of fact, Mr. Dean was not on my staff from a strictly table of organization standpoint. Uh, my contact with him would be um, well, three, four times a month on subjects that we shared a common interest or concern in. And they might be uh, uh, problems of, uh, of uh, mixed uh, substantive and, and technical interests, such as this whole problem of impounding of uh, appropriated funds, which uh, was both a, a substantive problem from my standpoint and from a budgetary standpoint and a, and a very tough technical legal problem, which Mr. Dean was working on in conjunction with the Justice Department. So we would come together on, on uh, problems of that kind. Well, uh, even though you described these so-called seniority relationships in a metaphysical term, would it be true to say that you certainly were senior to Mr. Dean? Yes. Mr. Dean, I would think, was in the, in the uh, second rank, uh, uh, just immediately under uh, five or six assistants to the president. And if Mr. Dean had important matters which he felt uh, either were in your area of concern or that you should know that he would report to you? Hopefully. And he also did he have a reporting function to Mr. Haldeman. I'm sorry, would you say that again? Did he have a reporting responsibility to Mr. Haldeman? Well, I don't know what arrangement was developed between the two of them. Uh, when I was counsel to the President, that was my line of report uh, through Mr. Haldeman to the President, and then eventually uh, it got more and more to be directly to the President. But uh, the counsel to the President is housed in the White House staff. And he's in the White House staff budget, and his line of report is to the chief of that staff, who in, that, in, the, in this case is Mr. Holden. Uh, but it would not be true, as many people would feel, uh, with some exceptions, that Mr. Dean, is, although he had the title of counsel to the president, would be frequently on a daily basis or a regular basis meeting with the president and counseling the president directly. Well, I, I, I don't know if that's a question or... Uh, it's a, it's a, it is a question. What a lot of people thought? No, what, what, uh, what your statement of the, of the position was. You held that position, and you knew Mr. Dean held it. Maybe we better start over, Ms. Dash. Do you want to put the question again? I don't think I'm tracking with you. Despite the fact that Mr. Dean held the position of counsel to the president, then is it your statement that he would not be reporting on a daily basis or even a frequent basis with the president to the president directly, but would be reporting to a senior staff member? Oh. Well, it depends. Uh, uh, if there is a matter in which the president has taken a personal interest, a subject matter in which he's taken a personal interest, he might very well ask for a direct reporting relationship with Mr. Dean on that subject matter, and in fact did obviously. Um, uh, on the other hand, if it's, if it's purely a routine uh, 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 kind of um, staff function that Mr. Dean's performing of one kind or another relating to, um, well, let's see, what, what would be a good example? Um, something that, that might relate, uh, say, to the, to the White House grounds, 
and the contractual relationship with the Park Department or something of this kind, he'd report to, to Mr. Holman. There'd be no reason to establish yeah. a direct relationship to the president. Well, did you have any uh, personal knowledge of uh, how frequently Mr. Dean directly reported to the president? It would come to my attention from time to time that he was doing so in a specific matter, but I certainly didn't try and, and uh, you know, uh, keep track. Well, would, would you have a, an opinion as to how frequently that would be? No, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, I, uh, if the White House if the White House logs indicated that Mr. Dean, from um, the time of his appointment in 1970 to sometime in February 1973, actually saw the president 10 times, would that surprise you? No, I don't think the number of face-to-face -face contacts is really the test. Um, uh, it's, it's a question of the, of the flow. A great deal of my work, for instance, with the president uh, wouldn't show on any log of my personal contacts with it. The president is an individual who works off a piece of paper much better than he works face to face. And uh, so I think there's a real, uh, there's real danger of inaccuracy in drawing conclusions from uh, that kind of a, of a tabulation. Now, what was your official and working relationship with Mr. Tolson? Uh, I didn't have a, a, an official relationship in the sense that he was on my staff or anything of that kind. Like Mr. Dean, from time to time, uh, he would uh, have a, a subject matter uh, uh, in his office, which I also had in mine, a substantive, substantive subject matter. Uh, more typically, uh, Mr. Colson, as sort of the White House man to organized interest groups, would come to me with a point of view, almost as an advocate for his clientele, so to speak and say, uh, you've, got to leave those, uh, you've got to leave those veterans' hospitals open because the veterans' groups are really worked up about this, and uh, I just had a meeting with them, and they say this and this and this, and here are some facts that maybe you don't have. So th it's those kinds of situations, typically, that I would, that I would be hearing from Mr. Colson. Now, did you know of Mr. Strong's position with Mr. Holden? Uh I learned a great deal more about it in the last two days than I ever knew before. Were you aware of uh, his particular role as liaison between uh, Mr. Haldeman and the committee to re-elect the president? Only very vaguely. Did he ever report anything to you when he came back from the committee to re-elect the president? No. Now, were you aware of the fact that by the summer of 1970, uh, Mr. Haldeman and the president uh, had felt a need for an improved intelligence system with regard to domestic dissent and internal security? Well, now there's a... Uh, the answer to the question is yes, but not the Houston plan. Uh, been, there have really been two things talked about in the, in the course of the hearings, and I knew about one of them, and I had only the merest brush with the other. Well, the question really didn't ask you about the Houston plan. It asked you, were you aware of a feeling of a need to afford an improved intelligence plan to deal with, say, internal security? Well, I was aware of the, of the feeling of the need, and I shared it. All right. Now, what, what plan were you aware of? I was aware of a proposal, which eventually, I believe, was put into effect, to establish a small office in the Justice Department to collate and coordinate and, and bring together in one place what the various law enforcement agencies, both in and out of the federal government, knew about these terrorism bombings and the, and the violence, street violence and these other, uh, uh, these other activities that were going on around the country, because it looked then like there really was a pattern and that it was a coordinated, uh, uh, planned, and, and uh, executed uh, thing. You, these, these things went in waves from one part of the country to the other. And it appeared that if what the police knew, for instance, in the city of New York could be shared with the police in other parts of the country, that you'd get a whole lot better uh, response to this kind of lawbreaking. So uh, under Mr. Mardian's aegis, this uh, effort was made to bring together the, the things that were known to all of the law enforcement people around the country. I know, did you know about the Houston plan? I did not know about the Houston plan until I was invited to attend a meeting that I think has been previously referred to here in the President's office 
attended by Admiral Geiler and J. Edgar Hoover and uh, the heads of the various, uh, Mr. Helms, the heads of the various intelligence agencies where uh, this proposal was announced. And uh, what was the, state, uh, the uh, stage of that proposal at this point? Announced as a proposal that would go forward? Well, I gathered that it was an accomplished fact. Yeah. And, and did, that, you, did you know what the proposal was about? Just from what I heard at that meeting. I had not seen the, uh, the uh, write-up. Well, did you know that the proposal included removal of certain restrictions uh, on break-ins, surreptitious entry, or wiretapping? No, I don't believe that was discussed at the meeting. And that never came to your attention, that that was in the plan? No, it did not. And Mr. Haldeman, who played such an important role, never discussed that with you. Would you say the I first said part Mr. of the Haldeman, Mr. Haldeman, who played an important role in working on the plan and having it recommended to the president, never discussed those aspects of the plan with you? No, uh, nobody discussed any aspects of the plan with me. But why were you called to the meeting? Well, I don't know that. Uh, there, were, there were quite a few uh, spear carriers at the meeting. Uh, from the White House staff, and I gathered that that was, uh, I was simply there for information, to get, to get information. Just to get information. Were you asked to express an opinion? No. Uh, and so far as you know, the plan was approved. That was the tenor of the meeting. Did you ever hear of anything else about the plan? Yes, I heard that the uh, director of the FBI had, uh, in effect, uh, scuttled it uh, by his objection to it uh, with the support of the Attorney General. But did you know why he objected to it? Uh, I don't think I ever knew with any particularity why. It was pretty obvious to me from hearing what I heard in the meeting that he was losing a good deal of sovereignty and that the Bureau was going to be asked to, do, to enter into uh, intelligence uh, gathering activities that the director didn't want it in. And I assumed that that was the basis. In other words, your assumption was that um, Mr. Hoover objected to the plan because uh, it uh, invaded his territory rather than because it uh, had any uh, parts to it that dealt with more surreptitious entry or wiretapping. I'm not, a, I'm not your best witness on this, Mr. Dash. That was purely an assumption on my part, and I don't think anybody ever told me. You never sought to inquire why a plan that you, were, you uh, saw at a meeting was being approved and would go forward uh, was being ditched because of Mr. Hoover's objections. You never sought to inquire as to why. It was so far out of my bailiwick at that time that I just had no occasion to. Well, it was out of your bailiwick to be interested in the uh, gathering of political intelligence? At that time, yes. Now, did there come a time when it did not uh, be outside your bailiwick? Well, it had been my bailiwick when I was counsel. As, as uh, uh, assistant for domestic affairs, uh, I had very little occasion to uh, be involved in, in questions of political intelligence or, or political anything, for that matter. Well, after the Houston plan uh, was, did not go forward, as you un, uh, understood it to be, that it did not, did you, were you uh, assigned a role to create in the White House a capability for intelligence gathering at any time? I don't know quite uh, what you're getting at. Are you getting at the special unit and the, and the problems of leaks? Well, I don't know why you have to find out what I'm getting at if you just answer well, my question as I ask it's it. A, it's an obscure question to me. No, it's a simple question. All if right, the answer is no, say no. If the answer is yes, say yes. Would you, would you restate the question for me, please? I said, did there come a time when you were asked to develop a capability in the White House for intelligence gathering? Intelligence gathering. The answer would be no. All right. Now, you were trying to see what I was getting at. Did you ever, were you ever asked to set up a special uh, uh, unit in the White House for the purpose of determining whether certain leaks had occurred in major national security areas? In, in point of fact, I was, in, and I'm strictly in terms of your question, I was not asked to set it up. Uh, uh, Mr. Krogh was asked to set it up. Uh, who is I, Mr. Krogh? Bud, Bud Krogh, Eagle Krogh, Jr., uh, was a member of the uh, domestic council staff. And uh, uh, he was asked by the president to form this special unit. Uh, I was designated as, as uh, one to whom Mr. Krogh uh, 
uh, could come with problems in connection with it, and the president said also that he could come to him with problems. Well, were you in at the beginning of the setting up of this unit? Yes, I was. And you knew what the unit was to do? Yes. All right, what was the unit to do? The unit, as originally conceived, was to stimulate the various departments and agencies to do a better job of controlling uh, leaks and uh, uh, the uh, uh, theft or or other exposure of national security secrets from within their departments. It was a group which was to uh, bring to account, so to speak, uh, the various security offices of the departments of defense and state and justice and CIA to get them to do a better job. And therefore, this unit was to gather facts if there was a leak or to act as a turn, I take it, uh, to prevent leaks. No, no, uh, there, there would have been no need to gather facts under that, under that concept, except to know that there had been an occurrence. But to uh, uh, require vigorous and uh, uh, very active effort on the part of the responsible people in the departments and agencies to find out uh, who was responsible and how it happened and make sure it couldn't happen again. Now, now isn't that getting, getting facts? If you, were, if you were seeking to find out who was responsible and you and the sorry. unit was looking for it, wouldn't you be wanting to get facts? Well, see, you were asking me about intelligence and... and no, I you're jumping again facts. ahead of me. I, I didn't say intelligence, I said facts. All right, the, the facts in that sense, but, but limited to that. Right. Now, would you say some people who go for uh, seek facts in an investigative way can also say they seek intelligence? Well, but you see, what I'm trying to say to you is that as originally set up and conceived, this was not an investigative unit in the sense that your question implies. It was, it was far more a, a group that was established for the purpose of getting the security people in the departments and agencies to do a better job of their job. Did it ever, was it ever called or was it ever referred to as a, an investigative unit? Subsequently, it was, because it became an investigative unit subsequently. So there came a time when you were administering an investigative unit. Is, yes, in, in, a, in a literal sense, that's true. In a literal sense? Yes, sir. But not in an actual sense. Well, I, uh, here I am dueling with a professor. No, no I'm not dueling with you. I'm just trying to get a... Professor, if you say actual, it's actual. Well, I, I, I don't want you to... Um, take my questions and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. Sure. Well, I'm, I really I'm want you to, to answer give you, to the I, best of your recollection. Right. And I'm trying to give you the, the real essence of this as we go along and I don't mean to be, I don't well, mean to be I'm fencing over do, words either. Could, could you please tell us in as clear a way as you can what the responsibilities of this particular unit was uh, both in the beginning and how it developed and then it developed later? I, I told you about the, the beginning of it. Let me tell you how it evolved. At a, at a point in time, uh, in, in connection with the Pentagon Papers thefts, a whole series of events took place. One of the first of them was that the Pentagon Papers, which were marked secret and top secret and which were Defense Department, largely Defense Department documents, uh, were turned over to the Russian Embassy. I knew this because I had a call from Mr. Marty and the Assistant Attorney General advising me that the Justice Department had this firm fact. The Attorney General came over and reported to the President that this theft had evidently been perpetrated by a number of people, a conspiracy, and that some of the people were identified by the Department of Justice as having had previous ties to domestic communist activity. The Attorney General then reported in response to an inquiry, and maybe I better tell you how the inquiry came up. Mr. Krogh came to me and said, I'm having real trouble getting the FBI to move on this. And so I said, well, and this was basically my function, was to do downfield blocking for Mr. Krogh when he had problems uh, in the departments. I said, okay, I'll contact the Attorney General and see what I can do, which I did. The Attorney General uh, uh, called me back and he said, we have a very tough problem here. 
it appears that a top man in the FBI put in a routine request that Mr. Ellsberg's father-in-law be interviewed. The director has given that top man notice that he's going to be transferred and demoted. And he has further given notice that that interview and interviews of that family are not to take place. Now, this was the area in which Mr. Krogh and the special unit were pressing for the Department of Justice to bring information together, as was their job to do. The Attorney General said, I'm going to reverse this decision on the part of the director to transfer this man and demote him. But he said, we have a very touchy situation with the director. Mr. Sullivan in the Bureau is extremely uh, upset and concerned and disagrees strongly with the director in this matter. I don't know but what Mr. Sullivan may quit as a result of this, this whole episode. It's very, it's very touchy within the Bureau. I said, what are our chances of getting the Bureau to move ahead on this right away? And he said, very slim or none. So it was from this set of facts and the real strong feeling of the President that there was a legitimate and vital national security aspect to this, that it was decided, uh, first on Mr. Krogh's recommendation with my concurrence, that two men in this special unit who had had considerable investigative experience be assigned to follow up on, on, the, on the then leads and rather, rather general leads uh, which were in the file. Now, who were, who were these two men? Hunt and Liddy. Now, did you know Mr. Hunt or Mr. Liddy? I had met Mr. Hunt once briefly. Uh, I had never met Mr. Liddy. Did you meet him or come in contact with him during the time he worked in the special unit? No. At, at no time? I don't believe I've ever met him. Now, now wait a minute. I'll take that back. He may have been in my office once. And I can't say whether it was before or after, in connection with a project that Mr. Krogh was working on relating to the organization of the Justice Department, which was his area of responsibility. And now, it, also, it's possible that Liddy attended that meeting. I, I, have, a, I have a vague recollection of that. Now, Mr. Young also worked in this unit, did he not? Yes. And he worked under Mr. Krogh? He worked as a kind of a co-chairman. What was the reporting relationship between Mr. Young, Mr. Krogh, to you? Well, Mr. Krogh, uh, of course, was on my staff and maintained the same reporting relationship to me that he had always maintained. Uh, Mr. Young uh, began reporting uh, to me uh, at the time that he joined that special unit. And uh, you say the same reporting relationship. I mean, was this a regular reporting relationship? As, as needed. We didn't have a system of weekly reports or monthly reports or anything of that kind. But just uh, when something came up that required my attention, they would let me know. And if it was important, they would. Would they not? Uh, I would hope that most of my people would handle things themselves. Uh -huh. they, they usually got to me. Um, I mean, I'm talking now about routine domestic things. They got to me as the last step before they went to the president. Did you ever initiate any uh, instructions to them? I was asked to um, ratify a number of their decisions from time to time, and their practice, Krogh and Young now we're talking about. Yes. Their practice would be to send me periodic um, uh, information reports or um, uh, status reports or progress reports, and sometimes those would contain requests for um, uh, either approval of a decision that they had made or a proposal that they had or something of that kind. Now, is this the Special Investigations Unit that later became, be, uh, began to be known properly as the Plumbers? Uh, yes. W when did that occur? That it became known as that? Yes. I, I don't know. That was, never a, that was never a term that was familiar to me until it, it was used in the press. Were you aware that there was actually a sign on the door of the plumbers? No. It may be apocryphal. I, I'm not sure. Now, did, did you actually interview Mr. Hunt before he was hired? No, I 
had a meeting with Mr. Colson and Mr. Hunt after he was hired. Um, it was in July of 1971, and I believe that's the only time I've seen Mr. Hunt. Uh, would it be fair to say that Mr. Colson uh, very much wanted Mr. Hunt to be hired? That would be fair to say. And you acceded to his request? Well, it was, a, it was an accomplished fact, I think, by the time uh, I saw it. Now, did you make a call for Mr. Hunt to the CIA uh, shortly after you saw him? Well, I can't recall ever making such a call. Now, you said that the major, major responsibility of this unit developed because of the need for the unit to go ahead on an investigation of the so-called Pentagon leaks. Uh, were there any other uh, responsibilities or assignments given to this unit? Yes. Could you state what they are? Where? Well, I can state some of them. I can't state all of them. Well, the uh, ones that you can. The strategic arms limitations negotiations were underway uh, in the summer of 1971, and a newspaper obtained uh, the United States negotiating position, the, the, in effect, the secret script for the United States negotiators in that negotiation. That came close on the heels of the uh, Pentagon Papers episode and uh, was a major cause of concern uh, for the president and for those dealing in this area of, of foreign policy. Um, the special unit was asked to see if they could determine the source of, of uh, that leak. Do you know what uh, actions or, uh, the special unit took in seeking to carry out that responsibility? Uh, in general terms, I do. I know that they worked through the uh, security people at the State Department and the Defense Department. Uh, they narrowed down uh, the, the probable source of that leak, and um, uh, I believe there were some personnel actions taken as a result. Uh, did you become aware of any wiretapping that took place uh, uh, at the request of the President and approved by the Attorney General with regard to that? In, in regard to the salt leak? Yes. No. Was there any, did you become aware of any wiretapping that was authorized by the President and also the Attorney General with regard to any particular leaks involving national security at this time? The answer to your question, Mr. Dash, is yes. It was in relation to an investigation in 1971 Beyond that, I cannot go. And you say that it did not re, uh, relate to the salt licks? No, sir. Did you know anything about the so-called Kissinger taps? Uh, the what? Kissinger taps. Yes, I knew. Uh, I, I did not know at the time uh, the details of those taps, that is, who was being tapped, the purpose, the extent, and so on. I, I knew generally that such a thing was going on. Did, uh, and did you know who would approve that? I don't know of my own knowledge, no. Well, how did you know you see you knew generally? How did it come to your attention? I think Mr. Haldeman told me uh, obliquely and, and not directly and not with any degree of, of, of uh, specific fact. Right. That but, such a such a thing was going on. Now, did there come a time when you had more specific fact? Well, obviously, in the last few months, I've learned a great deal more about that whole episode than I knew previously. Well, did you ever receive the logs of those uh, taps? Yes, I evidently did, without um, uh, scrutinizing them. Uh, uh, but I did receive them. Did you tell us how you received them? Yes. I received them from Mr. Mardian at the Justice Department. And why did you receive them? Well, I, pardon me, I didn't make that very clear. Mr. Mardian was at the Justice Department. I did not receive them at the Justice Department. I received them at the White House. I know. Uh, why did Mr. Mardian give them to you? He gave them to me because he felt that they should be in the custody of the White House and um, 
uh, proposed that they be moved out of the Justice Department because he could not assure their safekeeping there. Well, did you know that actually he was giving them to you at the direction of the President? I did not know that until I heard him testify to that um, here. In point of fact, um, I referred the question to the President, uh, perhaps unnecessarily. Uh, after Mr. Mardian originally talked to me about it, the President asked me then to uh, take custody of him, uh, which I did. At that time, did you, uh, did you look at them, or did you know what uh, they contained? I looked at them very, very quickly. He told me what they, what they purported, or what he said they were, uh, which was the, the uh, uh, logs and correspondence and, and uh, uh, synopses of a national security investigation in 1969. Well, then I related that to what Mr. Haldeman had described right. to me. And, and, these, I, and these were the logs and, and taps that were put on certain uh, newspaper uh, uh, persons and certain staff members in the uh, Mr. Kissinger. That's what I understand. Um, and where, where did you lodge these uh, logs? I lodged those in a two-drawer combination filing cabinet in one of the rooms of my office. Do you know what, what time this was when you did this? Would have been the in the uh, fall of 1971. And how long did they stay there? They stayed there until the day I resigned, which would have been the 30th of April of this year. And on that date, did something happen to them? Yes, sir. Uh, those uh, papers and all the papers in my office uh, were then uh, turned over to the president uh, as presidential papers. Now, you indicated that, uh, if, uh, that you were beginning to tell us about some of the other assignments that the Special Investigations Unit had, and would you go on, those that you can tell us about? Well, there's only one other that, I, that is in the public domain that I know of, and that is a, uh, an investigation into the circumstances of the leak of a CIA document uh, relating to relations between uh, uh, India and Russia. Now, did you, Mr. Ehrlichman, authorize uh, the taps we just discussed, or have any part in authorizing, or any other uh, wiretaps? Would you break the question down for me, Mr. Dash? Uh, it's, it's very I, compound. Well the, well, the first question is, did you have any part or role in authorizing the taps we just talked about, which you ended up being the custodian of the logs? Uh, no. Did you have any role in authorizing any other wiretaps? From time to time, I did. And, and in what area, could you tell us? Well, now we're in this area that... I'm not I'm asking any specific taps. I'm asking or any, for any specificity. National, national security, uh, uh, generally national security objectives. Uh, and uh, I'm under, a, I'm under a, a, a stricture which really doesn't permit me to be very responsive to your question. Oh, we appreciate that. And should there come a time when we have to get into it any further, uh, uh, more thoroughly, we could, the committee can um, uh, respond to that. But I'm not going into any specifics at this point. Uh, did you do? Did you authorize this, uh, these wiretaps in your role as uh, supervising the Special Investigations Unit? In 1971, that was so. Uh, in 1969, as counsel, uh, I authorized an attempt uh, which uh, never came to anything, was not actually accomplished. Uh, but uh, beyond that, it would have been in one of those two capacities, either as counsel in 1969 or in my relationship to this unit in 1971. Uh, were you aware of the electronic surveillance on Joseph Kraft's house? That was the one that I was talking about in 1969 that, so far as I know, never happened. And do you know who was involved in, in, in attempting your yes, view Mr. putting that tap on? Yes, Mr. Caulfield was. Oh, I didn't hear you. Mr. Jack Caulfield was. And did you ever discuss that tap with the President? I'm sure I did. Uh, do you know what the purpose of the, the placing of that tap was? It was a national security purpose. Now, did it, did it come to your attention that there was an effort to either break into the Brookings Institute or, the, or firebomb the Brookings Institute? Yes. 
Could you tell us how it came to your attention? It came to my attention, I think, from um, John Dean at the time that he came to California as he's described in his testimony. And is his testimony essentially correct on that? Well, I can't vouch for the hearsay aspects of it. Uh, he says um, Jack Caulfield told him that somebody else told him that I had authorized this thing, and, and that's hearsay so many times removed that it's very difficult to cope with. I can say very briefly I didn't authorize it. Do you know who authorized it? No, I don't. Did you ever look into who authorized no, it? No, I didn't. What was he asking you to do about it? He was asking me to make sure that it didn't happen. Did you? I believe I did. Well, how did you? I buy a phone call. To whom? I can't recall. I'm sorry to tell you. Uh, if I, you I, could, we might know who authorized. Well, out of out of fairness, I uh, you know I could give you a list of people that it might have been, but it's been so long ago that I I honestly can't recall who it was. But it was whoever he suggested that I call. I, I certainly don't want to go into a guessing game. Mr. Dean did say that uh, it was his understanding Mr. Colson had authorized it, and that. Uh, that was one, a name he had given to you. Well, I can't, I can't testify of my own recollection on that. And out of, out of fairness to whoever is involved, I would simply not want to lay before the committee a name here because I, I can't vouch for it. Now, I, you, do, I do remember the episode, though. And you, you cut it off. I believe that did it. I, uh, he was just really looking for somebody to give a little clout to his feeling that it shouldn't happen. I think you did indicate that you were aware of, of Tony Ulasiewicz's assignments. Uh, how long did he really carry out these assignments, uh, uh, either for the White House or for any person of the White House? I don't know. Um, my uh, relationship with him, so to speak, uh, ended at the time that I shifted jobs in early 1970. Um, he was he was a kind of a, a facility of the council's office, and he sort of went with the job. Now, you you did become aware uh, at some point of time. At this point, I don't want to go into this specifically of the uh, activities of your of staff members of the special investigations unit, Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy, with regard to the office of Mr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Yes, I did. And that took place when? The, uh, the so-called break-in of the Ellsberg Society. I've heard, I've heard two dates, but it was around Labor Day of 1971. Now, and I take it that was a fact-gathering uh, project. That was the fact-gathering project that I mentioned before in relation to the theft of the secrets and the turnover to the Russians and the, and the dilemma we had of the Bureau not moving on this. And when do you say that you learned you learned of that uh, break-in? Within a uh, day or two after my return from a Labor Day trip to Cape Cod. Now, in the fall of 1971, did you also learn of the so-called sandwich plan, which had been proposed for political intelligence gathering? I don't know exactly when that was is the is the date important to you i could look no, the date, well, no that's uh, i did i'm more did. interested in whether you knew or learned jack, of uh, mr caulfield's recommendation jack the, caulfield brought this little little folder to me and asked me to look at it and it was a plan for him to go out and set up a an investigation agency or a detective agency basically to is this do, what uh, he had been referring to as a republican inner tale? right and uh it was a three or four page double spaced typewritten prospectus is about what it amounted to. Uh, at that time, I was very much into the domestic policy business and very much out of the business of politics or, or political inquiry. And so mm -hmm. I said, Jack, you know, this isn't anything that I can help you. Uh, now, having, having looked at it, were you aware that it included both covert and overt activities? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't terribly specific about activities. It was mostly a selling piece about the kinds of people who would be involved and uh, <laughs> their ability to carry out a, an assignment and, and that kind of thing. Did it have a budget attached? No. I, I, I don't recall one. I don't, I don't think so. Now, I take it that all of these activities did, I think, 
at least show, or even though some of them may have been abortive, uh, a contingent interest in the White House to improve intelligence gathering so far as internal security matters. I think you've answered affirmatively that there was a feeling for a need for this and that these activities indicated that some efforts were going on uh, in order to meet this need. You've just scrambled the eggs, uh, Mr. Dash. Uh, these are all very separate subjects. And uh, you've taken me over a span of three years, and you've taken me into a lot of different subjects, some of which were vital national security, some of which were pure politics, some of which were uh, uh, really a need in our law enforcement system in the country for coordination. You've dumped them all in a hat and stirred them around and said, see these, what these bad fellows in the White House are up to. I, didn't not, I, I said nothing about bad fellows well, in the White House. And I asked you earlier whether or not you were aware of a, of a, of a need that the people in the White House, Mr. Haldeman and perhaps yourself, felt for an improved need for intelligence gathering. As an isolated subject, you're absolutely right. And there was such a need. There's no question about it, right. in my mind. And that, and some of the things that we have discussed uh, did include implementation or an attempt to implement the fulfillment of that need. Well, that particular need for knowing what the sheriff and the, and the police department in New York City and the state patrol in California knew and bringing it together and comparing what's going on around the country actually came into being. It was a little uh, four or five or six man office over in the, in the Justice Department and they did a fine job of bringing together this information and putting out on teletype to various places in the country that these bands of bombers and, and, and people of that kind were going around blowing things up. And the only purpose of the question was to find out that in fact some things were done and uh, not to include an inference of any bad guys in the White House at this point. That's very reassuring. Now, was the concern centered on uh, demonstrations, or did the concern become centered on demonstrations and possible violence in the oncoming 72 campaign? I know there was concern for that. Uh, the original plan was to have the, the convention in San Diego. And uh, I can recall uh, Mr. Dean asking me to uh, convene a get-together with the mayor of San Diego, who happened to be an old friend of mine, uh, in order that he could talk to him about the realities of the probable uh, protest demonstrations at the Republican convention in San Diego. And um, uh, so I know, there, I know there was that concern, because it was discussed at that time. Now, did you become aware or did you play any role in the creation of the committee to reelect the president? Well, that's two questions. Yes, I became aware of it. No, I didn't play any role. Now, did you know Mr. Magruder? Oh, yes. What, what, uh, how did you know Mr. Magruder? Well, Mr. Magruder worked at the White House, and uh, uh, I met him there in connection with uh, my duties and his, I can't, I can't say specifically on what occasion. Now, do you know what role Mr. Haldeman played in the creation of the committee to reelect the president? Specifically, I don't. I know he, he was obviously the, the uh, uh, one on the White House staff uh, who was designated to be the, the um, to take the primary interest in the in the yeah. campaign. Yeah, when you say specifically, Mr. Erdogan, and when some of my questions, when I ask them, I'm really not probing to see whether you know this from a, as an official, in your official capacity, or whether you played a role, but sure. uh, uh, whether you became aware, either through discussions with Mr. Haldeman, that you were there at the White House, you saw the committee, I take it, take form, and I think had some knowledge as to uh, who played some role in this, whether this came as well, a... I, I have to go back to what I said in my opening statement, Mr. Dash, which is the, is the truth, and that is that really this whole area of, of politics and the committee to reelect and so on was less than a half of one percent of what I was doing in those days. And uh, uh, it may seem surprising that I was indifferent or, or uh, uninformed, but that happens to be the fact.
Did you have a particular role in the campaign? Only to the extent that I've set it out in my opening statement. I had about three functions which I set out there. I take it you had a, uh, an interest in the re-election of the President. A very strong interest. And that you were dedicated to his re-election. Certainly. <laughs> Did you know that Mr. Liddy, Gordon Liddy, who had been a staff member in your Special Investigations Unit, uh, took on a very important role at the Committee to re-elect the President? I did not know it at the time. Did you know that Mr. Crow, who worked directly under you, had recommended him for that job? I don't believe I knew that. And that never came to your attention I, at that it, time? Not at that time, no. When, when did you first learn? Uh, I heard it testified to, and uh, I, I have no recollection of uh, having that question referred to me. It is not the kind of question that ordinarily would come to me. Uh, that's a personnel, a personnel question of that kind. You mean you first heard about it during testimony? I believe so. I believe so. Did you, you see? Were, I know uh, you were busy. I know you were very busy. No, it isn't a question of that. It's how we were set up. Mm -hmm. and, and personnel questions of that kind, of uh, um, uh, somebody leaving or somebody being hired or something of that sort, were most generally, hired, uh, most generally handled by my deputy, who no. looked after personnel things. I'm not, I'm not putting now the question as to whether you had a personnel relationship or knew it that way. But uh, I know how busy uh, you stated you, you, you were, but certainly you became aware of the break-in of the Democratic National oh, certainly. Headquarters. Of course. And you read the newspapers about that. That's right. Did there come a time shortly after the break-in you read something about Mr. Liddy's involvement? I think, uh, oh, yes, certainly. And at that time, did you read that Mr. Liddy worked for the Committee to Elect the President? Yes. So it's not true that you first learned about it in testimony. I'm sorry. The testimony that I heard here, to which I was trying to be responsive, was testimony of one of the witnesses who said, Mr. Krogh said, and here we're getting into all this hearsay again, that he had to get my approval for Liddy to go over to the committee. And that's the first that I ever heard that I was supposed to have approved his well, going Mr. over there. Mr. Erdogan, what I suggest you're doing again is anticipating the meaning of my question. The question put to you was, did you know that Mr. Liddy was employed at the Committee to Re-elect the President, not that you have a responsibility for that employment? I see. And when you said not, I said, when did you first learn? I said, from the testimony. Now, you wish to correct that answer. I see. I was not seeking at we this were... point to attach a re No, you were assuming one meaning to my question, which was not in the question. That, that I understand, is Irvin's law right. at work. I know. Do you, want to, do you want to correct your answer as to when did you first learn that Mr. Liddy was employed at the Committee of Elected President? Well, I think it must have been uh, subsequent to the break-in at the Watergate. And you know how soon subsequent? How, recent, how, how, how many days or weeks after the break-in? No, I think rather soon, rather within a matter of days after. Now, you knew at that time, certainly at that time, that Mr. Liddy uh, had been involved in the break-in of the psychiatrist's office of, at Mr. Elster. Yes. Did you say anything to anybody at that time when you read in the newspapers about the same Mr. Liddy now working for the president's campaign being found in another break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters, or at least being involved in it? Oh, I'm, I'm sure I must have commented on it. You commented? To whom? I have no, uh, I, I don't, I don't recall offhand. But you, it would not right. have been a, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of thing that that uh, was a matter of general conversation uh, at that time. Was it a matter of curiosity, or were you concerned? Well, for instance, I'm sure I talked to John Dean about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, he may have been the one that first let me know that Liddy was involved and and. Uh, uh, that it's the same lady who was at the White House. Well, as a matter of fact, isn't that true, that rather than learning about it in the newspapers, you learned from, about it from Mr. Dean? I think that undoubtedly is the case. Now, were you informed after March 30, 1972, that the Committee for the Re-election of the President had a sophisticated intelligence system with a budget of around either a quarter million dollars or 300000 No. Do you know whether Mr. Haldeman was? 
Uh, not of my own knowledge, I don't know. All right, now, when did you, Mr. Her Ehrlichman, learn for the first time of the break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters? It was the following day uh, when I received a telephone call. And where were you at that time? At home. And what, if anything, did you do? I made a couple of phone calls in response. Now, how soon thereafter did you learn that Mr. Hunt was involved? His name was mentioned in the original phone call. And who made that phone call to you? Uh, Mr. Boggs of the Secret Service. And how was Mr. Hunt identified as having been involved? One of the people arrested had his name in their possession. And then, shortly after, did Mr. Dean make a report to you about what he learned about the break-in? That would have been uh, the afternoon of the 19th. That would have been the following Monday, I believe. The following Monday. And what did he tell you? Uh, he just gave me a, a rundown of the identity of the individuals. He told me that he had talked to Liddy, I think that day, or possibly it was the next day that he told me this, that Liddy had told him that it was his operation, in effect, that he, Liddy, was involved, but that nobody at the White House was involved. Uh, I think that was about the... Well, did he report to you of, uh, about his uh, interview and conversation with Mr. Magruder? I don't recall his doing so. And so to your recollection, you say that Mr. Dean never told you about Mr. Magruder's involvement. Oh, I don't say never, but I, we're talking right. about this, not first at that time. Time, this first day. At least I don't recall it if he did. So at least by the 19, 19th of June, which is two days after the break-in, you knew one from a, on the basis of a, a call from a Secret Service man and the other from Mr. Dean, that the two men who had been involved in the so-called Ellsberg break-in were involved in the break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters. That, that's correct. And that these two, the two men, at least one of them specifically, Mr. Liddy, had a, had a position of some responsibility with the committee to re-elect the President of the United States. Well, I uh, uh, obviously had learned that he was working at the committee. I don't know about the responsibility. Well, did you know that he was counsel for the I, uh, finance committee of the, uh, of the uh, for the re-election of the president? I'm not sure that I did, I don't know whether it was described in those terms. Yeah. Now, having learned that persons who had the prior history that you knew about were working in a uh, were working in a close relationship to the campaign for the re-election of the president, you were so de dedicated honestly dedicated to see that he was re-elected. Did this, did this uh, produce any concern on your part concern, uh, with regard to the campaign itself? Well, this was, by, by Monday, was a campaign issue. And, and uh, within a matter of hours, the opposition had filed lawsuits and were making public statements, and there isn't any question about the fact that uh, it was a, an important campaign issue. Yes, I was concerned about it. Now, would it also be an even more, more of a serious campaign issue if it developed or, be, or was revealed that Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy had broken into the office of Mr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist? The same two people. No, I wouldn't think so. They were, they were certainly identified as, as uh, former White House people in the, in the media, and that was that connection I mean, that was, was bad enough. enough. That was that connection was established. What, what connection was established? Their that connection with the White House. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it had not been established. Uh, is it not true that Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy had broken into the psychiatrist's office of Mr. Ellsberg? At that point, it had not been publicly known. No, that was not publicly known. Are you telling the committee? That, that additional information, that these former White House staffers working under your direction that, that had, been, had broken into Mr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office would not have created an even more serious embarrassing situation for the campaign? I wouldn't think so, uh, Mr. Dash, for, for several reasons. Uh, number one, uh, that episode was a part of a very intensive national security investigation, which had been impressed with a very high security classification. The likelihood of that being disclosed was very slight. 
Number two, those people were operating, at least I, I believe they were operating, under express authorization. In a express, national, express authorization to break in? Yes, sir. Under, under national security situation, under a situation of, of uh, uh, considerable moment to the nation in the theft of top secret documents and their apparent uh, uh, delivery uh, to the Soviet embassy. Uh, it, it never was my um, view that Hunt and Liddy as individuals um, had, had done something that was completely irrational in, uh, in that break-in. In other words, they were operating in a national security setting and pursuant to uh, either instructions or authorization. And that being the case, um, uh, that had never been a uh, subject which I, which I considered to be seriously um, uh, embarrassing. Well, let's first take the first point you made, which was that it would be unlikely that it would be revealed. Right. And I take it to be unlikely to be revealed as Mr. Hunt and Liddy wouldn't talk about it. Well, neither they would talk about it, nor would a prosecutor talk about it if they told him. Uh, nor would any uh, employee of the federal government, aware of the national security characteristic of it, be talking about it. Now, how, how would you be assured of the fact that Mr. Hunt and Liddy would not talk about it? Well, the only assurance that one could have, I, I suppose, and I didn't give this a lot of thought, but you have uh, an, a couple of individuals here with long uh, uh, training and experience as law enforcement or intelligence people in the government, uh, Hunt for, what, 20 years, and Liddy for seven or something of this kind, and uh, it just didn't, uh, it, it never occurred to me to be a, a serious likelihood at that time. Now, I think you heard the testimony of Mr. Mitchell, or maybe you're aware of the testimony of Mr. Mitchell, the former Attorney General, that he first became aware of the so-called Liddy operations, which had included the Ellsberg break-in, on the 21st of June, when Mr. Marty and Mr. LaRue debriefed them after speaking to Mr. Liddy and that he characterized this kind of operation, plus some others, as White House horrors. And it was his view, it was his view, as expressed to the committee, that they were so, that the potential for embarrassment to the committee, to the re-election of the president was such that he withheld this information from the president because he thought it might cause the failure of the president from being reelected, you disagree with his evaluation? Well, I certainly disagreed with it at the time. And in other words, it, it, trying to uh, reconstruct my frame of mind at the time, I considered the the special unit's activities to be well within the president's inherent constitutional powers, and uh, this particular episode. Uh, the, the break-in in, in California, likewise, uh, to have been within the President's inherent constitutional powers as, as uh, spelled out in uh, 18 uh, U.S. Code 2511. Now, I think you've seen the, uh, once the information did become public and, you, and the press dealing with it and the reaction generally by, uh, uh, by the public to the break-in, uh, would you say that this was treated as a normal function of government uh, to authorize Mr. Hunt and Liddy to break into Mr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office? By the public, not, a, not as you saw it, but how the public reacted when they heard about it. I think, uh, I think uh, what is normal in the press these days is perhaps a, uh, a difficult thing for any of us to define, uh, particularly in this setting. Uh, taken at the time, either at the time of the Pentagon Papers episode, where you had these people stealing top secret documents and doing what they did on the one hand, or taken at the time of the, uh, of the campaign.
authorization. In a express national express authorization to break in? Yes, sir. Under under national security situation, under a situation of of uh, considerable moment to the nation in the theft of top secret documents and their apparent uh, uh, delivery uh, to the Soviet embassy. Uh, it, it never was my um, view that Hunt and Liddy as individuals um, had, had done something that was completely irrational in uh, in that break-in. In other words, they were operating in a national security setting and pursuant to uh, either instructions or authorization. And that being the case, um, uh, that had never been a uh, subject which I, which I considered to be seriously um, uh, embarrassing. Well, let's first take the first point you made, which was that it would be unlikely that it would be revealed. Right. And I take it to be unlikely to reveal it as Mr. Hunt and wouldn't talk about it. Well, neither they would talk about it, nor would a prosecutor talk about it if they told him, uh, nor would any uh, employee of the federal government aware of the national security characteristic of it be talking about it. Now, how, how would you be assured of the fact that Mr. Hunt and Liddy would not talk about it? Well, the only assurance that one could have, I, I suppose, and I didn't give this a lot of thought, but you have uh, an, a couple of individuals here with long uh, uh, training and experience as law enforcement or intelligence people in the government, uh, Hunt for, what, 20 years, and Liddy for seven or something of this kind. And uh, it just didn't, uh, it, it never occurred to me to be a, a serious likelihood at that time. Now, I think you heard the testimony of Mr. Mitchell, or maybe you're aware of the testimony of Mr. Mitchell, the former Attorney General, that he first became aware of the so-called Liddy operations, which had included the Ellsberg break-in, on the 21st of June, when Mr. Marty and Mr. LaRue debriefed them after speaking to Mr. Liddy, and that he characterized this kind of operation, plus some others, as White House horrors. And it was his view, it was his view, as expressed to the committee, that they were so, that the potential for embarrassment to the committee, to the re-election of President was such, that he withheld this information from the president because he thought it might cause the failure of the president from being reelected. Do you disagree with his evaluation? Well, I certainly disagreed with it at the time. And in other words, it, it, trying to uh, reconstruct my frame of mind at the time, I considered the the special units activities to be well within the president's inherent constitutional powers. And uh, this particular episode, uh, the, the break-in in, in California likewise, uh, to have been within the President's inherent constitutional powers as, as uh, spelled out in uh, 18 uh, U.S. Code 2511. I think you've seen the, uh, once the information did become public and, you, and the press dealing with it and the reaction generally by, uh, uh, by the public to the break-in. Uh, would you say that this was treated as a normal function of government uh, to authorize Mr. Hunt and Liddy to break into Mr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office? By the public, not as, not as you saw it, but how the public reacted when they heard about it. I think, uh, I think, uh, what is normal in the press these days is perhaps a, uh, uh, a difficult thing for any of us to define, uh, particularly in this setting. Uh, taken at the time, either at the time of the Pentagon Papers episode, where you had these people stealing top secret documents and doing what they did with them, on the one hand, or taken at the time of the, uh, of the campaign. Uh, you would, it, it depends on how many of the facts, how much of the facts, how much understanding uh, could be sifted through the, the daily press. Well, uh, I think if, if it is clearly understood that the President has the constitutional power to prevent uh, the, the uh, uh, betrayal of national security secrets, as, as I understand he does, uh, 
and that is well understood by the American people, and uh, an episode like that is seen in that context, uh, there shouldn't be any problem. Well, then, uh, you would not have had the same concern that uh, Mr. Mitchell expressed, that if he had told the President about it, uh, one, I, uh, the President would have lowered the boom, and in lowering the boom, he would have probably caused his own defeat as pre for President of the United States. In point of fact, on the, on the first occasion when I did discuss this with the President, which was in March of this year, he expressed essentially the, the view that I have just stated, that this was an important, a vital national security inquiry, and that he considered it to be well within the uh, uh, constitutional uh, both obligation and uh, function of the presidency. You say you first discussed this with the president in March this year? That's the first I can recall discussing it with him. Well, what was the purpose of the president's statement of May 22nd when he said that he instructed you and Mr. Alderman to take steps to prevent the fruits of the special investigative units from becoming known during the investigation of the Watergate as well, early as June. That's, that's quite another subject, Mr. Dash, and that relates to uh, some of the subject matter that I'm at this point not able uh, to talk to the committee about, which uh, the President has impressed with the highest secrecy classification in which he feels is, is very vital to the uh, national security of the country. Now, he, in, in furtherance of that, he has had me communicate his concerns about that to a number of people, and he, in turn, has personally communicated his decision in that regard to a number of people in the executive branch. Well, I'm not trying to probe any of the other secrets, but certainly uh, at the time uh, in June of 1972, right after the break-in, you were aware of, and I take it he was aware of, the break-in. The break-in? Yes. Which break? The Ellsberg break. In. I can't. I can't speak for the president on that. I can only say that I was aware. Well, didn't the president, in a statement, indicate that certain acts were taken by properly motivated people that he would not authorize, but that he had instructed Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman to see to it that none of these, none of this, which he were thought taken in the guise of national security should be investigated into by the FBI. Well, I took that instruction from the President to relate to a number of investigations which the special unit either supervised or engaged in, uh, in one way or another, over a period of months uh, spanning uh, uh, six, eight, eight, nine months. But you included the Ellsberg break-in in that? I included the whole, Pentagon papers, the whole Pentagon right. papers episode in that. So that it was your understanding that you were under instructions uh, to see to it that the FBI investigation did not get into this, did not uncover the Ellsberg break-in. No, 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 no. The Justice Department already had the uh, when? information about the Ellsberg break-in. When? Uh, I can't say when. John Dean told me that Henry Peterson had the information and the photographs and the whole business. Um, Oh, I would guess a year or more ago. A year or more ago? Yes, sir. And it did not take, the, and actually the prosecutors didn't learn about this when Mr. Dean went, went to the prosecutors? No. Mr. Dean told me that, as I say, about a year ago. Last November, he told Mr. Krogh the same thing. Told him that both Mr. Silbert and Mr. Peterson had this information and the photographs. And uh, when did Mr. Peterson tell you this? I've never discussed this with Mr. Peterson. Didn't you say Mr. Peterson told you this? No, Mr. Dean told me this. Now, the committee will stand in, the committee will stand in recess until 2 o'clock. A floor vote brought an early break for lunch, interrupting Sam Dash's questioning of John Ehrlichman. In a moment, he will pursue the authorization for the break-in of the office of Daniel Ellsberg, psychiatrist. Public television's coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification.
Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the public broadcasting service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back to the hearings, the subject matter is the break-in at the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Chief Counsel Sam Dash is still asking the questions. Uh, Mr. Elkman, prior, prior to the lunch and recess, you stated that in your opinion, the entry into the Ellsberg psychiatrist's office was legal because of national security reasons. I, I think that was your statement. Yes. Uh, have you always maintained that position? Well, I don't know. When I say I always, I'm not going back in eons of time. I mean, from the, I when don't you know first. I've ever been asked to maintain it uh, one way or the other. I have had a. Uh, well, do, you, do you recall? I had an awareness of the president's constitutional uh, uh, powers and capacity. Well, do you recall when uh, we had our first interview our, uh, in my office and we discussed this issue? Uh, you expressed uh, shock and uh, that such a thing had occurred, and indicated that you um, uh, had informed uh, uh, Mr. Young or Mr. Prog to see that this thing shouldn't happen again, but you didn't take any action such as ordering the firing of these people because of the general sensitive issues that uh, were involved. Do you recall that? Well, that isn't, that isn't on the ground of illegality, Mr. Dash, and I don't think you asked me at that time whether, uh, what my legal opinion was, uh, for whatever it's worth. Uh, what you were asking me is what I did, and that's, that's what I did. 
thought it was legal, uh, you would ordinarily have approved it, would you not? Well, no. The, the uh, thing that, that troubled me about it was that it was, that it was totally unanticipated. Totally what? Unanticipated by me, unauthorized by me. Well, and who was, it was authorized uh, by? Well, I'm under the impression that it was authorized uh, by Mr. Crow. Uh, uh, I say under the impression. I um, uh, that has been my that has been my consistent impression, but it's uh, it's not based on any personal knowledge. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Ehrlichman, didn't you personally? approve in advance a covert entry into the Ellsberg Psychiatrist's office for the purpose, purpose of uh, gaining access uh, to the psychoanalyst reports? A covert entry? Yes. I approved a covert investigation. Now, if a covert entry means a breaking and entering, the answer to your question is no. Well, let me uh, read to you a memorandum, and then I'll have it shown to you. Would uh, someone bring to Mr. Ehrlichman and his counsel a copy of the memorandum and also have it distributed to the members of the committee? The memorandum is dated August the 11th, 1971, and it's a memorandum to you from Bud Crow and David Young. Subject, Pentagon Papers Project, status report as of August 11, 1971. And I think the relevant portion is in paragraph or two, rather than the progress report of one. And let me just read paragraph two. We have received the CIA preliminary psychological study, copy attached to tab A, which I must say I am disappointed in and consider very superficial. We will meet tomorrow with the head psychiatrist, Mr. Bernard Malloy, to impress upon him the detail and depth that we expect. We will also make available to him here some of the other information we have received from the FBI on Elder. Now, most significant, in this connection, we would recommend that a covert operation be undertaken to examine all of the medical files still held by Ellsberg psych psychoanalysts covering the two-year period in which he was undergoing analysis. And there is a provision here for approve, disapprove. There is an E, which I take it you would recognize as your E, and in handwriting, which I would ask if it's your handwriting, that the approved and the handwriting is, if done under your assurance that it is not traceable. That's correct. Now, how would you interpret, in this connection, your, your assistants are recommending to you, in this connection, we would recommend that a covert operation be undertaken to examine all the medical files still held by Ellsberg psychoanalysts having the two-year period in which he was undergoing analysis, and this recommendation taking place sometime prior to the entry and approved by you. Well, there's no interpretation necessary, Mr. Dash. This was in the setting of a previous conversation in which it was contemplated that these two men would go to the coast to do this investigation, as the, as the President's statement of May 22nd says. The effort here was to find out everything that could be found out about the people and the circumstances surrounding Ellsberg uh, in, in all respects. Now, whether a psychiatric profile as such helps an investigator in that situation is something that the experts would have to tell you. That's something that I certainly can't second guess about. But the point here is that the, the investigation was already um, uh, authorized and was going to go forward. Now, covert, in its literal meaning and its everyday meaning, is simply that it is a, a covered operation. That is to say that you don't identify yourself as being an investigator from the Senate committee or from the... Uh, would, it, would it cover this, Mr. Arlevin, so that we at least agree on terms? Do you, do you want to hear the rest of it? Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you. Well, thank you. Uh, my concern 
And the reason that I certainly acquiesced in the, in the use of the term covert here was that I was not keen on the concept of the White House having investigators in the field and known to be in the field. And I, I just I don't think that from a, from a, uh, uh, a public standpoint, from a public relations standpoint, from a, from a public policy standpoint, that that's a that that's a desirable uh, situation, and I was I was not anxious to have anybody go in and flash a White House pass or credentials and say I'm from the White House and I want this or that or I want to ask questions. That is the sense in which I conceived, at least, of this investigation as being a covert investigation, and that's the sense in which I endorsed on here what I did in my in my hand. Now, if you're asking me whether this means that I had in my contemplation that there was going to be a, a breaking and entering. I certainly did not. I heard, a, I heard a remark by a member of the committee to the effect that there are only two ways that one can see a medical file, and that is either to get the, the doctor to violate his oath uh, or to break or enter. Well, I know that's not so, and I imagine those of you who have been in, in uh, uh, private practice uh, well recognize that there are a lot of uh, perfectly legal ways that medical information is leaked, if you please. And when I saw this, that's the thing that occurred to me, that, that by well, one way or another, this information could be adduced by an investigator who was trained and who knew what he was looking for. All right, let, let me follow that up a bit. It was after this memorandum, do you recall, that Mr. Young and Mr. Crow then authorized Mr. Hunt and Liddy to go out to California? Do I recall that? No, I yes. don't. And that they went out to California for a feasibility uh, test to see whether or not they could undertake a covert. And I'm not saying breaking and entering. No, my recollection uh, is that that, that um, trip west had been authorized before this. Uh, what was the purpose of the trip? I, as I've said before, it was to find out everything possible about Ellsberg, his associates, his uh, methods, his, his everything surrounding him. This business of the of the material for the psychiatric profile, as far as I was concerned, was an add-on. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wasn't even sure uh, uh, until I went back and refreshed my recollection by looking at this document, the middle of June of this year, where this all came in sequence. And when I had been asked about this, perhaps even when I talked to the committee staff, but I recall distinctly when I testified to the grand jury, I was asked which came first. The, the psychiatric profile draft or the, the trip and, and what the order, and I couldn't recall. But well, do you know what Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy did when they went out on the trip for the feasibility? Well, I didn't even know there were two trips, as a matter of fact, until I was told in the, in the rather recent past. Now, would, it, would your understanding of covert operation be that by a, not a breaking and entering, but being let, a lot, a let in uh, by uh, impersonating uh, themselves to be uh, somebody else uh, into the building. Isn't that a covert I, operation? I suppose it, that phrase could include that. It could include a lot of things. Yes. And therefore, uh, I don't think we have to quarrel about whether you approved a break, an entering, or even what you might consider to be a common law burglary. Well, but what no. I'm now saying is that the language here is not covert investigation, but a covert operation be undertaken to examine all the medical files. Now, the medical files, I take it, were in the possession of uh, Dr. Ellsberg's psychoanalyst, were they not? I don't know. Well, I take it that's where they w should be. Uh. Well, I don't know that, or whether they would be in a, in a medical record center or in a clinic or where. And in, in point of fact, as you know, uh, Mr. Dash, uh, well, the they didn't, uh, excuse, excuse, me, pretty clear. excuse me, just a minute. In, in point of fact, when they went in there, they didn't find them. Yeah, but read the memo again, Mr. Uh, Ellerkman. The memo says, examine all the medical files still held by Ellsberg psychoanalysts covering the two-year period. I think yeah. a, a clear reading of that is that they're in his possession. Well, uh, again, I don't, I don't mean to quibble with you. The words here are, are not my words. They're the words of the, of the writers of the memo. The thing, yes, the thing that was imparted to me by the word covert was that these people would not identify themselves as investigators of the White House or anything of this kind, and that their, their identities uh, would not be 
uh, known to the people right. that they were interrogated. So they would not identify themselves as representatives of the White House, but through some identification, they might get access to the building. And well, not necessarily. They might have gotten access through another doctor, through a nurse. I mean, there are all kinds of ways include, that one could get this information. Well, but it would include get, getting access to the building, would not, it not? Not inevitably. No, I didn't say inevitably. It would include it, would it not? As, as, one, as, of a a number, as, a, as one of a number of possibilities. Yes. And, and also access by, say, some covert uh, activity, not identify themselves as a member of the White House staff, get access to the office. Would it not include that as one of the alternatives that they could take? Well, uh, you're asking me to define phrases in somebody else's memo? Well, you approved this memo. You didn't, uh, you didn't put any other conditions on it, did you? No, I'm, I'm trying to tell you what I thought I was approving. No. Well, uh, th those, those who, um, who read it uh, undertook to uh, also interpret what you thought you were approving. Did it not, by the way, did, did uh, Mr. Young and Mr. Crow call you while you were in Cape Cod after uh, Mr. Young and Mr. Liddy came back and tell you that they had established that it was feasible, that they could get access, and that you said, okay, go ahead and let them do it? You recall that call that Mr. Crow and Mr. Young made to you in Cape Cod? No. I don't, as a matter of fact, don't recall any business calls while I was up there at all. Well, would you be surprised if I told you that Mr. Yes, Young would so testify? Yes, I would. That um, uh, Mr. Liddy and Mr. Hunt did in fact go out to carry out the feasibility study, did engage in what they considered to be a covert activity, not a break-in, and through the, uh, a cleaning lady gained access to the building and saw they could gain access in a similar way to the office, did return, and then on the basis of that, Mr. Young and Mr. Crow got on the phone with you while you were in Cape Cod and told you that they were able, therefore, to prove that it was feasible. And you said, okay, when you were assured that Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy would not themselves be involved. Do you recall that? Well, now, that's about how many questions all in well, one? I've just given you a set of facts. Yes, and I don't recall any such set of facts. Now, I, I'm, I'm stopped at the phone call, as a matter of fact, because where I was up there, I'm, I'm quite sure I didn't take any calls from the office. Well, I think you've already indicated that you had a discussion with them before the memo was sent and before it was approved in which they discussed the uh, possibility of getting access to the uh, files of the psychoanalyst. No, no, you misunderstood me. The discussion that I had with them related to the necessity of putting investigators out on the coast to investigate Ellsberg uh, uh, over and beyond the FBI effort. You don't, you don't recall that sometime in or July and August uh, that you had a discussion uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Krogh and Mr. Young, in which this specific question came up. Uh, which, as, which specific speci question? I'm finishing my, my question. As to getting the uh, files uh, on Ellsberg, psychoanalyst files on El Ellsberg. In July or August? Yes, prior, prior, to the, prior to the date of the memo of August 11th, that this was a discussion you had with Mr. Young and Mr. Krogh. I don't recall it. I can't, I can't rule it out. It may have been along with uh, the memorandum. I just don't You know. would not be surprised if Mr. Young were to so testify here on the road that he had such a specific discussion with you. I, I would be surprised. No, I, I rather imagine that this uh, memo arrived in Mr. Young's hand or Mr. Krogh's hand or, or perhaps with the both of them. That was ordinarily the way these, these uh, status reports would come, and no, we would sit down and use those as an agenda. Well, the question that I, I, I put to you was not the memo, but prior to the drafting of the memo, which came to you first for your approval, that there was a discussion that you had with Mr. Krog and Mr. Young about doing this very thing through a covert method, getting access uh, to the uh, files, the psychoanalyst files, of Mr. Ellsberg. No, I don't, I don't recall such a conversation. I would, it would be my guess that if we had had such a conversation that that would have made the memo superfluous. 
Would it? Uh, that, the memo, that, would the memo, my, that would be my wouldn't assumption. It be, yeah, wouldn't it be in preparation for the drafting of such a memo to get your specific approval in writing? No, that isn't, that isn't ordinarily the way we did business. The only time I would be asked for something like this is if they had trouble in getting in to see me. They wanted to, they wanted to uh, set up an agenda so that when we did get together, we hit a number of topics and so on. Now, do, uh, do you recall that on March 27th, Mr. Young had a meeting with you at a time when he was leaving this, uh, the White House. We had a meeting around that time. March 27, 1973. And do you recall that you asked him to pull together a number of the papers that the Special Investigative Unit had had, and that he did? Do you recall that? All, I, I think I asked him to put all of them together, yes. In a bag. He brought them to you in a bag. In a bag? No, I don't. Uh, I think my request to him was that since he was leaving, all of the special units' documentation should be gathered in one place so that it could be transferred to the president's file. Did you review them before they were transferred? No, they were. There were drawers and drawers of them. Do you recall receiving a number of papers from Mr. Young and then returning them? minus this memorandum and another, which I'll talk, ask you about. No, the, the receipt of documents, as I recall, was in gross. This document has been in my files, and I saw it there the other day. I'll just put the question. You can answer sure. yes or no to this. And do you recall when Mr. Young raised the question concerning uh, the memorandum, you said that it was too sensitive a memorandum and uh, that you had retained it. No. No. And do you as far as I know, I have, I have had in my files, uh, un actually unknown to me, this and a number of other documents uh, relating to the Ellsberg matter. I don't know for how long, and I don't know from what source. Um, I do know that at the time that Mr. Young was leaving, we asked that he pull together everything, and I believe he turned all of his documents over to Todd Hullen in my office. Do you recall telling Mr. Young at that time, uh, in that meeting on the 27th, that uh, you suspected that Hunt may be going public in California on this operation, and that uh, Mr. Young was uh, equally concerned that this may be possible. No, the, well, th what I told him was not on the 27th. As I recall, it was earlier than that. I had an appointment with the, Mr. Young shortly after Mr. Dean came in to say that the White House was being blackmailed by Hunt. And I reviewed with both Krogh and Young, uh, because this was all quite dim in my recollection, what it was that Mr. Hunt might say, uh, what, the, what the national security aspects of this were again, and, and went over the whole ground with him in the, in the light of uh, the uh, blackmail attempt. Now, that must have been on the 20th or the 21st or not later than the 22nd of March. Well, uh, do you recall telling uh, Mr. Young, that Mr. Krogh was going to be taking the responsibility for that, and that Mr. Young reminded you that maybe Mr. Hunt or some others made some copies of this memorandum, and that you indicated that, well, if that no. were so, that what the position to take would be that it would be a national security matter, you'd button up. No. The, the conversation basically was for me to inquire of Mr. Young to get as much information I, as I could about what it was that Mr. Hunt was, in effect, threatening to say. And he went into this in, in considerable detail with me at that time, that is to say, the, the general subject matter. Now, did you, uh, did you also indicate to him that the uh, President knew about this and had fully authorized it or felt that it was a perfectly legal matter at that time? If I may have. I, I well may have, because in that period of time, 2021, 22 March, somewhere in there, 
I did have a conversation with the President about this. Now, by the way, did you also receive a memorandum uh, suggesting that there be a congressional investigation about the Ellsberg affair? I have had a memorandum in my file from Mr. Colson on that subject. I don't know if that's the one to which you referred. Did refer. you receive one from Mr. Young? Uh, about a congressional investigation? Yes, suggesting that Mr. Marty and then some others be involved in this. I may have, but that goes way, way back in time. I haven't seen anything like that. Dated August 26, 1971. I, I well may have. Does, uh, do you recall having received this memorandum? It has my initial on it. I don't have a present recollection of the document. Can you also uh, note that there's an attached memorandum on the same date uh, for Mr. Colson from you, Mr. Ellickman, subject, Hunt Liddy Special Project. And I quote, on the assumption that the proposed undertaking by Hunt and Liddy would be carried out and would be successful, I would appreciate receiving from you by next Wednesday a game plan on how and when you believe the materials could be used. Do you recall that? Yes, I've seen that recently and going back into the files. Yes. Uh, now, I just have one one last question. There are others, uh, Mr. Arlickman, that I would like to get into, but I've taken sufficient time and uh, we'll have a chance to question you later. But you also indicated this morning, when I put the question to you, whether you were concerned that the, whether or not the so-called entry, whether you call it the Ellsberg break-in or we take the, in this particular case it was a break-in, uh, the Ellsberg break-in, would become known publicly, whether that would be embarrassing to the campaign. And I think you responded, as far as you understood, and I think Mr. Dean, you said, told you, that Mr. Peterson or the prosecutors already knew this and knew this for some time. Is that correct? Mr. Dean and Mr. Krogh also told me that Mr. Dean had told him that. Now, I think what you indicated is that they had some pictures. Yes. But was it your understanding that they knew what those pictures meant, that those pictures really re related to a break-in of the Ellsberg psychiatrist's office? Yes, what I was told was that there were uh, uh, photographs of the interior of the office that showed that a ransacking or an entry uh, 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 search had taken place. Now, you knew at the time, certainly uh, during 1972, from the summer of 1972 on, that there was a trial in process uh, with Mr. Ellsberg as a defendant, and that if, in fact, the prosecutors had this uh, information, there would have been some responsibility or duty to turn this over to the judge, which, in fact, by the way, was with the 
uh, recently with the support of the president. Did I know that? Yes. No, I didn't know that. I mean, would you expect that if they had this earlier, they would have turned it over earlier? Uh, I didn't have any reason to expect that. Well, let me show you another a memorandum, which we just, uh, just received, dated April 16, 1973, from uh, Mr. Silbert to Mr. Peterson. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll make a copy right, right away, and, and I, I'll have this shown to you as soon as I read it. Uh, this, is, this is to inform you to, that on Sunday, April 15, 1973, I received information that a date unspecified, that a date unspecified, Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt burglarized the offices of a psychiatrist of Daniel Ellsberg to obtain the psychiatrist's files relating to Ellsberg. The source of the information did not know whether the files had any material information or whether any of the information or even the fact of the burglary had been communicated to anyone associated with the prosecution. And the accompanying memos take it all the way to the prosecutor back from Mr. Peterson indicating that these, these should be shown to Judge Byrne, uh, who was uh, pre presiding at the trial. Were you aware of this memorandum that Mr. Silbert sent to Mr. Peterson in which he indicated that they, were learned, that they learned this on Sunday, April the 15th, 1973? Yes, I've seen that. And are you also aware of President Nixon's statement on May 22, when he stated, I considered it my responsibility to see that the Watergate investigation did not impinge adversely upon national security areas. For example, on April 18, 1973, when I learned that Mr. Hunt, a former member of the Special Investigations Unit at the White House, was to be questioned by the United States Attorney, I directed Assistant Attorney General Peterson to pursue every issue involving Watergate, but to confine his investigation to Watergate and related matters and to stay out of national security matters. Subsequently, on April 25, 1973, Attorney General Kleindienst informed me that because the government had clear evidence that Mr. Hunt was involved in the break-in of the office of the psychiatrist who had treated Mr. Ellsberg, he, the Attorney General, believed that despite the fact that no evidence had been obtained from Hunt's acts, a report should nevertheless be made to the court trying the Ellsberg case. I concurred and directed that the information be transmitted to Judge Byrne immediately. You, of course, recall the President making that statement. Yes, I do. Now, it would be quite obvious that if the Mr. Peterson or the Department of Justice had information earlier, they certainly wouldn't have waited until April 25, 1973 to inform the President uh, and get the President's permission to inform the court. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. In other words, it would be your position that they held this back as long as they could. Well, if Mr. Dean told me the truth and told Mr. Krogh the truth, then obviously that's what happened. I can very clearly recall Mr. Dean coming into my office and saying, you'll never guess the, the bounce that this thing has taken now. He said, uh, Peterson has got the pictures. And the way he described it to me when uh, Hunt went in there or was around there, he took pictures. And he left the film in the camera when he returned the camera to the CIA and the camera developed, uh, w uh, the film was developed and then sent over to the Justice Department. And uh, here was this address and the doctor's name and Liddy standing in front of the place and the, and the ransack business. And, and uh, uh, we both just shook our heads over this. Uh, as, I've as it turns out later, that isn't quite what happened. Uh, the CIA, uh, out of, I guess, sort of traditional uh, caution, made copies of all of, the, uh, all of the films that Hunt turned over to them to get a free developing and printing job. And uh, so they took these copies and sent them over to the Justice Department, apparently. But in any event, uh, I can't vouch for this uh, uh, on my own say-so. I can only tell you what Dean told me, and, and in those circumstances, and then in comparing notes with Krogh, uh, he says that when Dean was counseling him on his testimony at the time he was coming before the Senate for confirmation at the Department of Transportation, Dean told him that not only did Peterson have this,
but that Mr. Sobert had it as well. Now, here again, this is hearsay, and it's, it's only as good as the testimonial reliability of Mr. Dean, and I'd be the last one in the world to vouch for that at this point. Oh. Did, by the way, did you ask Mr. Dean to get that film back from the CIA? No, no. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to have marked uh, as exhibits and introduced in evidence the um, memorandum uh, to Mr. Ehrlichman from Mr. Crow and Mr. Young dated August 11, 1971, and the memorandum uh, to Mr. Ehrlichman from David Young dated August 26, 1971, as well as the memorandum just uh, submitted to um, uh, Mr. Uh, Ehrlichman uh, from Mr. Silbert to Mr. Peterson. I understand they've all been identified as a witness. Yes, no, sir. No, oh, no, 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 sir. Uh, I think he's identified the first one, August 11th. Part of the second, I think you recognize. Uh, did you recall? I recall the last page of the second. Uh, I, I think that's my chop mark on the rest of it, although I don't have any present recollection of it. The third one, uh, Mr. Silbert's uh, internal memorandum in the Justice Department has been shown to me, but I can't vouch for it. Well, we just have it uh, then, uh, just Well, I'll admit the, the first two papers as, as uh, exhibits and uh, the reportable so will number them appropriate as such. The second I'll have marked for identification, but will not uh, admit it this time. But the third one, I mean. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I do have uh, quite a few questions still, but I, I don't think I should ask them at this point, uh, and I have no further questions at the present time. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chairman, I do have one or two lines that I would like to pursue, and then with the Chairman's permission, perhaps after the members of the committee have asked questions of the witness return to other lines. Mr. Ehrlichman, as I understand it, by June the 19th, you knew that Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy had, in fact, broken into the DNC, or allegedly so, and also that uh, they were former members of the White House staff. Is that correct? No, I don't believe so, Mr. Thompson. I think uh, uh, sometime on the 19th, Mr. Dean told me about Liddy's involvement. Uh, the only connection that I had uh, with regard to Hunt was this call from the Secret Service that said that his name had been in the possession of one of the uh, uh, people caught in the, in the Democratic headquarters and that uh, the card or the paper or whatever it was said White House on it. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't very many days after that before uh, the link was made, I guess, but uh, as of that day, I don't think I knew that. Mr. De <clears throat> Dean has testified that Liddy also told him that Magruder was involved in some way. Magruder pushed him. Uh, he also testified, uh, uh, Mitchell and uh, LaRue and Marty and testified that they got essentially the same information from Liddy on June the 21st, I believe. Was any of this information imparted to you in, uh, in June of 1972 concerning Mr. Magruder? I can't say. Thompson, whether it was or not, there came a time when there was a there was a feeling that that uh, at least on my part, based on what Mr. Dean was uh, telling me about the the unfolding of this thing, that Mr. Magruder may have had some involvement, and that culminated in a meeting with the Attorney General, the end of July, uh, on the on the 31st of July, where Magruder was specifically discussed, but uh, just where in there I. I acquired information. I can't, I can't tell you. When you acquired this information, did you discuss this information with the President? Well, as I say, I can't, uh, I can't say in the, in the interim. I do recall discussing with the President the comments of the Attorney General and Mr. Dean arising out of our meeting of July 31. Do you recall approximately when this conversation took place? Would have been within a day or two after that. Uh, would have been... Uh, in the, in the first week in, in uh, August. First week in August? Yes, sir. Will be the first occasion? Well, I, don't, I, I can't say the first occasion, but it's the one that I have a, I have a recollection of. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, let me refer to the President's statement of May the 22nd again, which has been previously referred to, and give you a quotation from that statement. The President says, I wanted justice done with regard to Watergate, but in the scale of national priorities with which I had to deal, and not at that time having any idea of the extent of political abuse which Watergate reflected, I also had to be deeply concerned with, with enduring, ensuring that neither the covert operations of the CIA 
so the operations of the Special Investigations Unit should be compromised. Excuse, excuse me, Ms. Thompson, could you tell me where you're reading? I can't that's quite on, hear you. And that's on follow. page 5 of the President's five. statement of Thank you. May 22nd. It's the last full paragraph. Right. All right. Therefore, I instructed Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman to ensure that the investigation of the break-in not expose either an unrelated covert operation of the CIA or the activities of the White House Investigations Unit, and to see that this was personally coordinated between General Walters, Deputy Director of CIA, Mr. Gray of the FBI. It was certainly not my intent nor my wish that the investigation of the Watergate break-in or of related acts be impeded in any way. Is that correct? Were you, in fact, given those instructions? We were asked to meet with the CIA people uh, month of June, and Mr. Haldeman and I did that. Uh, at a point in time, I think some months in advance of the Watergate break-in, the President had made it very clear to me that the whole special unit activity was, he felt, impressed with the highest level of, uh, class, of, of security classification. It simply was not to be talked about. And I had passed that along to Young and Krogh and, and others. But uh, I don't recall uh, ever talking to either the CIA people or Mr. Gray about investigations which might lead to the special unit as such. Prior to the break-in? Either prior or, or subsequent, for that matter. Well, you talked uh, on, uh, on June 23rd. You had a, had a discussion with Mr. Helms and Mr. Walters. Yeah, but it did not relate to the activities of the, of the special unit with regard to the Pentagon Papers right. or anything like that. But, but it <coughs> related to CIA activities. Yes, sir. Of course, the President refers uh, any statement to both CIA activities. And, and as I say, I can, I, I can say that we had the one meeting with the CIA on, on the 1st. I don't recall any conversations or uh, efforts to uh, uh, protect the, the activities of the special unit from the FBI's investigation. But you did have a conversation, I assume, with the President after the break-in concerning the covert activities of the CIA and the Special Investigations Unit. Well, the sequence of events was that Mr. Haldeman told me that the President wanted me to sit in a meeting, which I then did. That's Cold. the June 23rd meeting. Yes, sir. Cold. Uh, without having talked with the President about it. Uh, it was not until the 6th or 7th of July that I really had a conversation with the President about that subject and had then a full feeling for what his uh, concerns were. Mr. Ehrlichman, the, the logs which the White House has supplied the committee, uh, reflecting your meetings with the President, show a, a meeting on June 20. Uh, the President met with Mr. Ehrlichman in the President's EOB office, a meeting evidently with, uh, with the President where no one else attended, a meeting of 55 minutes. Of course, this is three days after the break-in and three days prior to your conversation or, or your attendance where a conversation took place between Helms, Walters, and Haldeman, I believe. My question is, what was discussed in this 55-minute conversation three days subsequent to the break-in? That was, according to my notes of the meeting, was principally taken up with two subjects, uh, welfare reform. Uh, I was just about to come up to, to talk with uh, members of Congress about H.R. 1, which was then pending. And the other subject was the Broomfield Amendment, which uh, related to busing. The activities of the Special Investigations Unit uh, was not discussed at all at that time? No, sir. Of course, at that time you realized that a former member of the Special Investigations Unit uh, uh, was implicated in the Watergate break-in, did you not? Uh, meaning Liddy? Yes. Right. And the President did look to you for, for supervision of the Special Investigations Unit, did, did he not? Well, the Special Investigations Unit, Mr. Thompson, was only had a life of about 60 to 90 days. Uh, it was formed on the 24th of July, 1971. By the 20th of September, the President had, had uh, sufficiently stimulated Mr. Hoover and the Attorney General had sufficiently stimulated the Justice Department that they were very much back in business and the President and the Attorney General had a meeting and 
pretty well turned the whole, the whole uh, Pentagon Papers business back to the Justice Department. There was one um, uh, investigation that carried on into the end of the year, and by uh, Christmas time or the first of the year, why, uh, and incidentally, that one only involved uh, one member of the, of the unit. The rest of them were out of business. So that uh, all through the early part of 1972 and on down into the, into the summer, there was no uh, special unit. But the problem that, that Hunt and Liddy presented to the President, I would assume, presented to the administration, had nothing to do with the length of time that was served. I assume that the problem that they presented was the fact that they had worked uh, in the White House and they had engaged in certain activities, perhaps knew about others, and that might be exposed because of, of the Watergate situation. I, I don't think anybody was thinking in those kinds of terms, Mr. Thompson. They were thinking in terms of here were some people who were in the White House, uh, they're long gone from the White House. They haven't worked here, but it's possible for people to impute to the White House some implication in this in this silly act by reason of their former employment there. I don't think anybody was thinking that these fellows knew dark secrets or that there was any uh, uh, that there was anything that they might say uh, that would be uh, harmful to the uh, campaign of the president in those kinds of terms. All right, and this problem that you just related, I assume, is is the substance of the conversation you say you had with the President about July 6 or 7? Well, July 6 or 7 is when we talked about the CIA and when I got a feel for why it was that I had been asked to sit in this meeting that Mr. Haldeman and I had with Director Helms and General Walters. But when did the President instruct you to ensure that the covert CIA uh, activities were not exposed by the Watergate investigation. Was well, it during this conversation? The, the instruction came to me secondhand, and it wasn't as crystal clear as you've just made it. Well, I'm reading from, from the statement. Well, I'm sorry, the to, I'm sorry to disagree with the, the interpretation of the statement that you're giving, but the, the fact is that morning, Mr. Haldeman said to me, the President wants you to sit in a meeting. Now, I did that. Uh, Mr. Haldeman led the meeting, imparted the, the President's message to the Director and to the Deputy Director, um, uh, and I was very much an auditor at that meeting. I just, I just sat and, and pretty much listened until there evolved from the meeting a, and it wasn't hard to figure out what the, what the drift of it was, there evolved from the conversation a clear impression that there might be a problem. And so, uh, the conclusion of the meeting simply was that General Walters and Pat Gray at the FBI would sit down together and talk through what the problems might be. Were those the instructions which uh, the President's referring to here? Afterward, yes. Afterward, I learned from the President that his concerns were, as they're set out there in the statement, that disassociated, unrelated to the Watergate in any way, there might be CIA operations, which would be uncovered. And you have to understand that right at this time, we were experiencing massive leaks in the FBI, so that the fruits of the FBI investigation might very well be in your morning newspaper or in Time magazine, more typically. The concern here was that the FBI would, it would come upon information bring it into the FBI files, and you'd read it in your newspaper, and the CIA would be compromised. Now, that is what I have so what learned the, after the fact, right. relating so what, back to the meeting. From what you know, the instructions referred to in the present statement here have to do, first of all, with the implied instructions, if you would term it that way, that you got from attending uh, the meeting of June the 23rd, plus the President's later statement to you on uh, July 6th or 7th. Right. Of course, he states here that within a few days, I was advised that there was a possibility of CIA involvement in some way. But he didn't talk directly to you about that until July 6 or 7. I'm, I'm not your best witness on that. Uh, he talked to Mr. Haldeman about that, and I got things uh, secondhand up to, the, as I say, the 6th or 7th of July when we had a direct <clears throat> conversation. When did he advise you or when did he instruct you to ensure that the uh, activities of the uh, Special Investigations Unit were not exposed in the Watergate investigation. I felt that there were standing instructions from about the 1st of 1972 on that. 
I don't recall a new set of specific instructions. Uh, uh, and as I just testified, uh, I'm not aware of any conversations or any specific instructions to Mr. Gray or anyone else to look out for this area or stay out of this area or anything of that kind. There were internal instructions. For instance, uh, at a point in time, Mr. Young's secretary was to be interviewed by the FBI. And Mr. Dean's office contacted her to make sure that she knew about the standing instructions that the special unit's activities were not to be disclosed. The President says here that within a few days, he learned of possible CIA involvement, and then he instructed you and Mr. Haldeman to make sure that the covert activities of the CIA and the activities of the Special Investigations Unit were not uh, exposed. From what I understand you say now with regard to the CIA involvement, you attended one conversation which you really didn't know what it was all about until you got into the conversation on June 22nd with uh, Helms and Walters and Haldeman that you first discussed the CIA involvement uh, on July 6 or 7, and that you never did really receive any specific instructions to keep uh, the Special Investigations Unit's uh, activities from being exposed. Well, I, I did receive specific instructions, but they predated Watergate by uh, five or six months. And uh, well, I mean, I, that would go without saying with regard to all uh, internal activities of uh, of the White House with Mr. Well, but this didn't go without saying. This was very specific, very strong, very pointed. So you received instruction, but it, but it preceded the Watergate. Yes, sir. But you felt in your mind after the Watergate break-in and after, say, uh, July 6, 7, anyway, that you did have instructions, however they came about, to ensure that the, the covert CIA operations and plumbers' operations unrelated to Watergate were not uh, exposed. No. No. Yeah. Now, I, I, I think you have you misunderstood me, Mr. Thompson. We had a we had a meeting with Mr. Helms and Mr. Walters, General Walters, excuse me. There were a series of conversations then as a result of that meeting between General Walters and Mr. Gray. The conclusion of those conversations came around the 6th or 7th of July. The President then talked with Mr. Gray, and his instructions to Mr. Gray were, in view of the CIA's conclusion that there was no danger of such exposure, to go all out with an FBI investigation. And then he backed that up with instructions to me that I was to pass along to Mr. Gray that Mr. Gray was to determine the scope of the investigation so that by the 6th or 7th of July, and I'm, I can probably pin that date down for you in, a, in just a second here, but the, the um, uh, it, well, I think it was the 8th, as a matter of fact. Uh, let's see. It was the day he saw Clark, no, excuse me, the 6th. He saw Clark McGregor the same day. It was Thursday the 6th. By that day, the President had determined the matter in conversation with Mr. Gray. There was no CIA either involvement or potential for leak or exposure. And the President's instructions to Mr. Gray were, let's have an all-out FBI investigation, and that's just what happened. So the matter had been resolved by July 6th. Yes, sir. Well, you previously stated, I believe, that July 6th, or 7th or 8th, was the date in which the President instructed you to ensure that... I'm sorry. It's the date I, it's the date I understood from our conversation what his concerns were. He gave me a very full explanation so of, the why, of why he had asked that we meet with Mr. Helms and General so, Walters back on the, uh, in the first week, and his he obviously had a, uh, a separate source of information that he was acting on back at that time to the effect that there might be CIA involvement or that there might be CIA operations, which somehow or another could be compromised by an unlimited FBI investigation. So, and really, the purpose of that, that June meeting uh, with Walters and, and Helms <coughs> was, to, it was to find out if there was anything like
Mr. Young's secretary was to be interviewed by the FBI, and Mr. Dean's office contacted her to make sure that she knew about the standing instructions that the special unit's activities were not to be disclosed. The President says here that within a few days, he learned of possible CIA involvement, and then he instructed you and Mr. Haldeman to make sure that the covert activities of the CIA and the activities of the Special Investigations Unit were not uh, exposed. From what I understand you say now with regard to the CIA involvement, you attended one conversation which you really didn't know what it was all about until you got into the conversation on June 22nd with uh, Helms and Walters and Haldeman, that you first discussed the CIA involvement uh, on July 6 or 7, and that you never did really receive any specific instructions to keep uh, the Special Investigations Unit's uh, activities from being exposed. Well, I, I did receive specific instructions, but they predated Watergate by uh, five or six months. And, uh, well, I mean, I that would go without saying with regard to all uh, internal activities of, uh, of the White House with Mr. Well, Ehrlich. but this didn't go without saying. This was very specific, very strong, very pointed. So you received instruction, but, but it preceded the Watergate. Yes, sir. But you felt in your mind after the Watergate break-in and after, say, uh, July 6, 7, anyway, that you did have instructions, however they came about to ensure that the, the covert CIA operations and plumbers' operations unrelated to Watergate were not uh, exposed. No. No. Now, I, uh, I think you have you misunderstood me, Mr. Thompson. We had a, we had a meeting with Mr. Helms and Mr. Walters, uh, General Walters, excuse me. There were a series of conversations then, as a result of that meeting, between General Walters and Mr. Gray. The conclusion of those conversations came around the 6th or 7th of July. The President then talked with Mr. Gray, and his instructions to Mr. Gray were, in view of the CIA's conclusion that there was no danger of such exposure, to go all out with an FBI investigation. And then he backed that up with instructions to me that I was to pass along to Mr. Gray, that Mr. Gray was to determine the scope of the investigation. So that by the 6th or 7th of July, and I'm, I can probably pin that date down for you in, a, in just a second here, but the, the um, uh, well, I think it was the 8th, as a matter of fact. Uh, Let's see. It was the day he saw Clark, no, excuse me, the 6th. He saw Clark McGregor the same day. It was Thursday the 6th. By that day, the President had determined the matter in conversation with Mr. Gray. There was no CIA either involvement or potential for leak or exposure. And the President's instructions to Mr. Gray were, let's have an all-out FBI investigation, and that's just what happened. So the matter had been resolved by July 6th. Yes, then. sir. Well, you previously stated, I believe, that July 6th, or 7th or 8th, was the date in which the President instructed you to ensure that... I'm sorry. It's the date I, it's the date I understood from our conversation what his concerns were. He gave me a very full explanation so of, the why, of why he had asked that we meet with Mr. Helms and General so, Walters back on the, uh, in the first week, and his... Infor he obviously had a, uh, a separate source of information that he was acting on back at that time to the effect that there might be CIA involvement or that there might be CIA operations, which somehow or another could be compromised by an unlimited FBI investigation. So and really, the purpose of that, that June meeting uh, with Walters and, and Helms <coughs> was, to, it was to find out if there was anything like that in, in possibility. The upshot of the meeting was, yes, maybe there was something like that in possibility. And so... So your previous statement, as I understand it, was, was incorrect. And you're, did I misunderstand you, or are you withdrawing your, your pre previous statement to the effect that you received those instructions on July 6th? Well, I, I didn't receive any instructions. I received an explanation on... on of what had already occurred. Yes, sir. The point I'm trying to get at is whether or not, similar to the, to the instructions with regard to the plumbers, that... Uh, 
you never did really receive any specific instructions from the President with regard to seeing that the CIA covert activities were, were not exposed? Well, I did through Mr. Haldeman in the, well, sense of having this, in the sense of having this meeting in June. As far as the President sitting me down and saying now, as, as he did, incidentally, in the case of the plumbers, sitting me down and saying, uh, I consider this vitally important. I don't want to hear about anybody talking about it, and so on and so forth, which happened, as I say, around the 1st of 1972 with regard to that. Um, no, I, I didn't personally get a, a direct order from the no, president. You didn't personally get any direct orders from the president after the date of the Watergate break-in with regard to either CIA covert activities or plumbers activities to keep, as we, keep them from being uncovered. As we come into the March 1973 period, yes, I did, because as a response to this March 20th blackmail um, attempt by Hunt, the President renewed his strong feeling that this whole special unit activity was impressed with a national security characteristic of the highest order. And he had me renew his injunction at, the, at that period to several people. All right, let's discuss this, this June 23rd meeting which you had with Helms, Walters, and Haldeman. You've explained your presence at the meeting, I believe, and Mr. Haldeman suggested that the President wanted you uh, to attend. <clears throat> I assume you're also aware of some public testimony I believe Mr. Walters has given with regard to what transpired at that meeting. Could you tell us what, in fact, transpired at that particular meeting? Well, as I recall, the, uh, Mr. Haldeman explained that the meeting was held at the President's request that it was because of the President's concern, as I've mentioned, that CIA activities uh, either were involved in the Watergate, one, or two, uh, some totally unrelated CIA activity might be exposed by the investigation of the Watergate. Could I ask you, could I, could I stop you at that point in a minute? If you'd rather carry through, you just tell me, and I'll be glad for you to do so. But what caused Haldeman or the President as far as you know, to believe that CIA activities, uh, that, that CIA, uh, that the CIA might possibly be involved. Well, I became satisfied <laughs> later. I didn't know at the time. I became satisfied later in this July 6 meeting that the president had a source of information on which he was relying that was apart from uh, anything that he described to me. I never did know what his source of information was, but it was it was evident to me from the conviction with which he discussed this subject, that his concern was based on some source of information which he considered reliable. Now, I, I went on, I, uh, I should have gone on to say that, that Mr. Haldeman also explained to the three of us, Helms, Walters, and me, that the President felt that he must order a full, complete, unlimited FBI investigation of the, of the Watergate matter. That this had become already a serious political issue, and the only tenable political position for him to be in was to turn the FBI loose on this and let them conduct any kind of an investigation that they could or should. Now, Mr. Haldeman then explained the implications of that, which were obvious. If the CIA were involved in the Watergate, then obviously that would be embarrassing, awkward, and, and difficult for the CIA. Mr. Helms and General Walters assured us that that was not the case. Then Mr. Haldeman said if there were any other CIA activity or operation totally disassociated from Watergate, which a, an investigation of money or people, uh, uh, it being well known that, that some of these uh, people who'd been apprehended had been on retainer to the CIA and so forth, if any of these circumstances led to a disclosure of CIA operations disassociated from the Watergate, that too would be awkward. It was there that we did not get the same kind of flat assurance that we had gotten in, in the first instance. And so rather than for us to probe that, for dates and places and names. It was simply agreed that General Walters would make a, an early appointment with Pat Gray and sit down 
and talk with him about what the problems might be. And that's what was done. The outcome of those talks, and I guess there were two or three of them, was simply that Walters and Gray agreed that there was no problem. And Gray then talked with the president on the phone when the president was in San Clemente, uh, I believe on the 6th. And then the president, very shortly after that, told me about the telephone call, what his instructions to Gray had been. And then he explained to me what his concerns were about this, rather nearly in the terms that I just explained them to you. Did he say that his concerns were that there was CIA involvement with regard to the Watergate break-in or that there was unrelated CIA involvement which might be exposed? Well, he said that in the, in the inception, at the beginning, that had been his, both had been his concern because of the fact that some of these uh, people who had been arrested uh, had had CIA connections in the past. And the, the information that had come to him uh, uh, persuaded him that there was at least a potential problem. Did Holloman ever tell Walters or Helms to go to Gray and tell him to, in effect, hold off or slow down with regard to the Mexican investigation because of CIA involvement? No, my recollection, no. The answer to that is flatly no. My recollection is that the Mexican investigation was one of the things that, that was discussed and as to which Mr. Helms and General Walters could not give us a categorical assurance that uh, uh, FBI investigation wouldn't create problems for them. So that that was simply noticed as one of the kinds of problems that uh, might arise in which General Walters and the director of the FBI ought to compare notes on. So in other words, you were m merely presenting it to him, according to your testimony, to find out whether or not there would be CIA embarrassment, possibly, and willing for them to work the matter out, find out, report back, so the matter could be resolved. Well, not even report back in, in that sense, uh, as a, in reporting back to us. As a matter of fact, we said at that point, look, we're, we're out of this. We just wanted to crystallize this, wanted to get you together with the FBI. Uh, the White House contact on this would be John Dean, who is the fellow following this entire matter. So in effect, we turned General Walters and, and Mr. Helms over to Dean for any future contacts that they might have on this. You wouldn't know whether or not uh, John Dean on June 7 went to Walters and told him that uh, it would be good if the CIA could help raise bail money, could help raise some salary money, that the witnesses were wobbling and could be in trouble? I read that in the newspaper, and it, it really surprised me when I read it. And so I, I wondered the origin of this until I heard Mr. Dean's testimony, which was that he had been asked by Mitch, Mr. Mitchell to do this. I had, in effect, set this up without knowing it by telling Walters that Dean was his White House contact from that day forward. But I did not know about these conversations. Dean never, was not reporting back to you? Not about United? that, no, sir. Did you have occasion to call Mr. Gray and call off a meeting which he and uh, Walters scheduled on June 28th to tell him that the meeting would no longer be necessary, that matters had been worked out in some way. Well, I, I didn't realize that I had canceled it. My strong concern about that meeting was that it was going to include some staff members from the FBI. And as I say, we were experiencing these leak problems, and right at that particular time, one of the people who would have been included in that meeting was under very strong suspicion as being the source of that leak. We had had independent information, which we were talking to Mr. Kleindienst about, about that specific individual. And it appeared that this whole thing was going to include him. And so that was the, that was the reason for my call. Did you ask Ray precisely who would be in attendance at the meeting? Yes. Uh, did, you, uh, did you talk to Well, Mr. I don't know as I asked him. I think I was told. I think, as a matter of fact, I think Mr. Dean told me. Did you tell him of your suspicions or concerns about Not the at individual? that time. Not at Why? that time. Well, because we were talking to Mr. Kleindienst about how to go about smoking out this problem uh, around Mr. Gray, frankly. Why? Why? Why around Mr. Gray? Well, because Mr. Gray at that time was not acknowledging the problem. Uh, then you had spoken to him about it. I well, I'd spoken to him about the leaks. I hadn't spoken to him about this specific man in this specific meeting it, until this call. But uh, Mr. Kleindienst and I discussed on several occasions how we might go about determining the source of the leak 
Uh, we talk, he, he proposed uh, the idea of uh, planting a uh, story or a set of circumstances and seeing if it turned up and, and this kind of thing. So we were, we were dealing with the Attorney General direct on that. Did you talk to Walters about this meeting? I don't believe so. <clears throat> I don't believe I talked to General Walters couldn't, again. Couldn't Gray and uh, Walters have had a meeting, the two of them? Yes. That was the problem? That was the, was that, that, was suggested? the that was the whole idea. That was, the, that was suggested in the inception. You didn't tell them that the meeting would not be necessary? I, I don't recall what I told him, except that... that so it would be inconsistent with your desire to resolve the matter, I assume, as to whether or not there, were, that there was any CIA involvement. Well, what, whatever I told him was for the purpose of not having staff meetings on this particular subject. And uh, I, I can't tell you precisely what I told him. Going back to uh, July of 1971, July 7 of, 19, uh, of 1971, did you call uh, Deputy Director Cushman and ask him to give Mr. Hunt assistance in his activities at that time? No, I've been asked many times about that telephone call, and I simply have no recollection of having made that call. Did you know what Mr. Hunt was doing during that period of time, where he was I, working? I knew from my one meeting with Mr. Colson and Mr. Hunt jointly what he was supposed to be doing, yes. What was he doing? He was supposed to be engaged in an analysis of the Pentagon Papers and, and in determining their accuracy, whether or not they were in fact complete accounts of the events which took place or whether they were edited, uh, tailored uh, accounts um, uh, which did not include the, the complete facts. <clears throat> In June, when you were talking to Helms and Walters about the, the possible CIA problem or uncovering some uh, collateral CIA activity, did you know at that time the, and of course this all evolved around the so-called Mexican problem, the Mexican money problem, I assume. Is that correct? Well, it was much broader than that. It was any uh, unassociated um, well, what, CIA brought, activity. Well, what, what brought it to anyone's attention? I thought it was, I thought it was the, the so-called Barker money that uh, had come from Mexico. You mean that, that precipitated the meeting? Yes. No, it was a much broader concern than that, and it included, as I said, the question of direct involvement. It, it included whatever exposure there might be for any CIA activity. I think the, the Mexican money or the Florida bank account or whatever which involved one of these people who had been a former CIA agent or, or uh, client or whatever they call him, uh, uh, was raised as an example in the meeting by one of us as the kind of thing that the president evidently was concerned about. And can it was discussed as a specific example, can, but the meeting was by no means limited to that. Can you recall any other specific examples that were discussed? Bay of Pigs. Uh, how did that, how well, did that? because uh, uh, the, um, uh, apparently the president had specifically mentioned the Bay of Pigs to Bob Haldeman in suggesting the meeting, and then he mentioned it to me again in July as the, uh, the kind of thing that apparently uh, uh, CIA might be embarrassed about. The, the, um, uh, some of the people who were involved in the Watergate apparently had been involved in the Bay of Pigs, and the question of whether there was any uh, CIA exposure uh, still existed. The Watergate uh, investigation could possibly turn up some, some additional information on the CIA involvement with the Bay of Pigs? Well, either the CIA involvement or compromise some source or some, uh, something in the past. It was very unspecific, but it was nevertheless mentioned as an example. Can you think of any other examples? No, I can't. Uh, the... the um, Mexican, Mexican money or Mexican laundry or whatever you... Of course, that money wound up in the bank account of a Mr. Barker. Yes. And Mr. Barker, of course, was, was a protege of, of Mr. Hunt and brought into the matter, evidently, by Mr. Hunt. A, a CIA protege. They went, yes. They went back to the Bay of Pigs, I believe. Uh, was that realized? That, no, uh, it wasn't. I mean, that problem, that problem you were talking about, the Mexican Barker. money pro problem that you were talking about was directly related or seems to be directly related, seems to have been related to Mr. Hunt, well, which Barker, gets, right back in, gets right back into the, uh, to the plumber situation again. Barker's name, Hunt's name, were not mentioned in the meeting.
Mr. Ehrlichman, regardless of what the President specifically told you or did not tell you, I assume that you felt a short time after the break-in, the latter part of June, that it was the President's wish to ensure that the investigation of the break-in did not expose either the unrelated covert operation of the CIA or the activities of the White House Investigations Unit. Did you assume that to be the President's wish Mr. as Thompson, he stated I that it was? I assumed that it was with regard to the CIA because of this meeting we've just been talking about. Frankly, the, the question of the special unit simply never entered my mind at that time as a, as a potential problem. It just was not in contemplation, and it was not in the contemplation of anybody that I was talking to, so far as I can recall. Even though Liddy had worked? That's correct. In your office, under your supervision, generally? Well, he had worked in my office in a, in a very remote sense. It didn't occur to you that if he was... Uh... He was tried and he decided to talk, he decided to bargain, that uh, there was a lot of things that he could tell uh, that would be embarrassing, uh, not only politically, but uh, compromising with regard to national security? I, I assure you, Mr. Thompson, it just was not in my consciousness. Well, it evidently crossed the President's mind. When do you think that uh, these matters which he sets out in, in his May 22nd statement uh, came to his mind? He says that he was informed uh, within a few days about uh, a possible CIA involvement. The implication is that he knew about the about the existence of the unit, with regard, uh, regardless of any specific activities. But he knew about the uh, about the unit all along. Oh, he did. There's no question about that. Can we, uh, we can we assume that from the very beginning, from from the time immediately after the break-in, that he was concerned on a national security basis, as he says, about the plumber's activities being revealed? Well, uh, uh, if I could finish what I started to say, Mr. Thompson. He knew about it. His meeting with Mr. Krogh back in July of 1971 is what charged it up and, and generated the steam behind it. The concern about the special unit, uh, to my knowledge, was not evidenced uh, around the White House until the FBI interviews of individuals began in sometime in June, when Mr. Dean's office did counsel people who had been connected with the special unit, like Mr. Young's secretary and others, to be very cautious about uh, opening up that subject. Now, that was a very broad subject. It ranged from, from the Pentagon Papers through SALT and these other, these other investigations. But that was when this cautionary note was introduced. If the President passed that instruction, as I say, he didn't pass it to me directly. He must have passed it to Mr. Dean or someone else. Well, how, when did you first, come, first become concerned about exposure, about exposing the plumber's activities? I would think um, March 20th of this year. March 20th of this year? Uh, at the time of the uh, Hunt blackmail attempt. Where did the President get his information from which to make this, this June 22nd statement? He said he was concerned uh, uh, about uh, the reasons for the subsequent uh, uh, improper activities, which he admits evidently took place. The reason for, for this was people becoming evidently overzealous pursuant to his general instructions that the CIA covert activities and the plumber's activities unrelated to the Watergate not be exposed. Well. How could he get his information? How could he be concerned about the plumber's activities except through you, to oh, whom my. he looked for? Are we going for a walk? Business on the Senate floor has once again interrupted the interrogation. We'll pick it up again in a moment. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we go back to the old Senate caucus room, Minority Counsel Fred Thompson is questioning John Ehrlichman. Gentlemen, I don't believe I gave you a chance to answer that last question. If you recall the, the dialogue and would like to respond, please do so. Maybe you could help me a little, Mr. Thompson. Well, you indicated, I believe, that you really became concerned about exposure of, of the so-called plumber's activities, I believe, in March of this year. Uh, and I was inquiring about what appears to be to have been the president's concern much earlier. Uh, well, I, right, I, after I the, right after the break-in. Right. Uh, and you asked me uh, how in the world would he have known about it if I hadn't told him. Uh, well, what that concern was, the source of it, and, and what it was, if you know. Well, of course, the, the president has many, many channels of information in, and he gives instructions to a number of people besides me on a whole range of subjects. So uh, I, I wouldn't want you to have the impression that that uh, he depended on me as a sole source of information or as a sole conduit for his instructions, either one. Um, I became aware of a very active uh, concern and a, and a very active um, uh, practice on the part of Mr. Dean and his colleague, Mr. Fielding, uh, to counsel uh, people who had in some way been associated with the special unit uh, uh, in one way or another. Uh, that when they were interviewed by the FBI, that this was a subject that was impressed by the president with a very high security classification. And uh, that would have been, uh, the, the FBI really was, was uh, conducting interviews in the White House uh, in the month of June and, and on into July. I think they finished, for all practical purposes, their uh, intensive investigation in the White House during the month of July. Would, would he not have normally uh, expressed his concern to you, whether or not he was getting any information from you, uh, since he looked to you for, for supervision of this group, would he have not uh, expressed his concern to you about your, in effect, your former employees? Would, would he not? Uh, did he not? I, I can't recall that he ever did, Mr. Thompson. I believe you did state that, that early on you felt like you had standing instructions that uh, these matters uh, of national security involving the plumbers, I believe, were matters which were not uh, to, uh, to be exposed. Yes, sir. I have a standing. very clear recollection but you had no of a fear conversation with the president around the 1st of 1972 in which he made that very, very clear. But you had no personal concern until March of this year what? Either the, that, that those matters would be exposed or if they were exposed that they would have any significant repercussions? I think the former. Uh, I, had, I had rested um, uh, secure in a, in a passive sense. I, this wasn't something that was on my mind a great deal. But uh, I, had, I had felt that this was a, a set of subjects of real delicacy in terms of national security and that Really, if there were any subjects that would not be um, uh, talked about freely or, or uh, find their way into the public domain, that this is one of those sets of subjects that would not. And um, I didn't have any, um, any conscious concern that uh, uh, anybody in, uh, involved in it, Hunt and Liddy included, uh, would have... Uh, Told those. Well, when, when, did you, when did you first become aware of the fact that, that money was being raised to, to pay Hunt, among others? I'm not sure that I knew who money was being raised for in any specific sense. You've asked me about Hunt. So uh, Watergate defendants? Uh, uh, yes, I was aware that, that um, uh, there was a need for uh, a defense fund, a, a attorney's fees fund. 
Um, when did that come to your attention? It, it must have been late in June. And it came to me through Mr. Dean, who said that uh, uh, the defendants were losing their attorneys, attorneys were quitting, they were not being paid. Uh, John Mitchell felt very strongly that it was important to have good legal representation for these defendants uh, for a number of reasons, for political reasons, but, uh, but also because we had these civil damage suits that had been filed by the Democrats against the Committee for the Re-Election and the, and the Republicans. What do you mean for political reasons? Well, just that if there were to be a trial and it were to take place before the election, that obviously that trial would have uh, some political impact and good representation was, was simply essential. How would, how would money help in that regard? Money Motions would, for continuances? Or? Money would help to retain attorneys. At least that was my, my understanding of the concept. It certainly does do that. Evidently. What about later on? Did it, become, did it come to your attention that there were increasing pressures by Hunt specifically for money, for more money for himself, for his attorneys? I don't think I became aware of that until sometime after the first of the year. And then it came not in the, not so much in the um, money sense uh, uh, where Hunt was concerned, but it, it related to this uh, uh, episode of his trying to make contact with Mr. Colson to uh, uh, satisfy himself that, that Colson was still standing by him and that he was still his friend and this kind of thing. Uh, it wasn't until we got into about the 20th of March that I became aware that Hunt was in fact making strong money demands. You didn't have any discussions with anyone, Dean or anyone else, during all this period of time that Hunt was in fact uh, threatening to blow the lid off if, uh, unless his money demands were met? No, I don't you, believe so. You drew no, no distinction in your mind between Hunt and Liddy and uh, the Cuban Americans. They were all just one as package. Two, as two groups? Yes. You didn't feel like it was any more imperative that Hunt and Liddy have sufficient funds to hire good lawyers to make them happy than for the Cuban Americans? No. And it wasn't obviously to make them happy. It was, it was for the purpose that I've stated. Humanitarian? Well, no, I, I conceived of this as being like the, you know, like the Daniel Ellsberg Defense Fund and the Angela Davis Defense Fund and the, and the Berrigan Brothers Defense Fund. It's, a, it's apparently a, a, a commonplace of American life these days that uh, 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 these kinds of funds are created and that uh, people do donate to them. And, uh, is, your un is it your understanding that this particular defense fund was going to be secret? No, as a matter of fact, Mr. Dean told me that there was a, a public defense fund uh, being created in Florida uh, at right around this time. But this was not the one that, that uh, Mr. Kalmbach was engaged in, was it? This was a, as I understood it, one that had been generated within the Cuban community down there. Well, that's, is that not something completely separate and apart from what Mr. Kalmbach was doing? Didn't Mr. Kalmbach come to you and, and in essence, uh, tell you that he was raising money and ask if it was all right? Well, not, not quite in those terms, uh, but I had a conversation with Mr. Kambach about the fact that he was raising money for attorney's fees. What? Give us the, the, the essence of that conversation, if you can. When did it occur and what was said? It occurred on the 14th of July out in his office in Newport Beach. Uh, that's a, that was a Friday afternoon. I stopped at his office on my way from the Western White House back to the uh, 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 place that I was staying, which was on farther north. And uh, he showed me his offices. We talked about the California political situation, uh, which he was then uh, very concerned about, and on which he had a number of ideas. And he mentioned to me in the, in the course of that get together that he was now raising money. Uh, he said it rather um, philosophically because we had had a conversation back sometime uh, in February or March in which... How, how do you talk about raising money philosophically? Well, uh, this way. Uh, 
he, he had hoped to get out of the money-raising business the 1st of April. And uh, we, had, we had hatched a rather elaborate plot to get him out of the money-raising business. Uh, in the, and, the, and it was that uh, Bob Holman and I would be his defense uh, when Maury Stans and John Mitchell asked him to get back into the fundraising again. He said he had, he had had that activity and he had been at it a couple of times in presidential campaigns and he really wanted to do other kinds of things to be helpful. And so we agreed that when he was approached by Mr. Stans or Mr. Mitchell that he would say, and we would back him up, that he was going to do uh, political chores for the White House on assignment. Um, the, uh, he, he was philosophical about it in the sense that it was sort of, well, uh, maybe you've heard, could I'm, I ask, could I'm I ask back you this? raising money again. Pardon me for interrupting. Could I ask you this? He testified essentially that he looked into your eyes and says, John, I know your family, you know my family. Is this the thing to do? Is it all right? You said, yes, sir, if it is. Now, did that happen? I'm sure if he had looked into my eyes and I had looked into his eyes uh, and we had invoked the names of our wives that I would remember that solemn occasion and I, I'm sorry to say I don't remember it. Uh, uh, I would never in my life ask Herb Kambach to do anything that I thought was shady or improper, certainly not illegal. And if Herb Kambach had ever said to me, do you vouch for the propriety or the legality of what I am doing, I would have been very, very slow to make any assurance to Herb without a lot of research to satisfy myself. And that's why I'm pretty sure that that kind of request was not made of me and I did not make a response because I never did have occasion to research it or Dean to had, find out about it. Dean had already talked to you about it previously though. Well, he talked to me about it, but he had said, look, I'm going to, I'm going to see uh, if we can get Herb Kambach lined up to raise some attorney's fees for John Mitchell, who says we've really got to do it for the reasons that I've stated. He said, if he checks with you, uh, back me up on this. Just one more. Now, it happened that he didn't check with me. Herb didn't call me, uh, and, and we didn't talk about it until he was well into the project, as I say. It was, as I recall, the 14th of July when we first discussed it. And the balance of the conversation after he said, as I say, rather resignedly that he was back in this, uh, that he was using Tony Elasowitz to carry cash. And I got the impression that he was carrying cash from California to the East, and I may be mistaken about that, but uh, I related that to Dean's very brief conversation with me before about this. There was no solicitation of, uh, of him to me, uh, is this okay for me to do or anything of that sort at that time. Now, he was in my office again, back here, uh, what, 12 days later, I guess it was, on the 26th, because my log shows that. Um, I don't know. Um, the, uh, he, made, he made periodic visits and he would come in and he'd have a whole list of things that he wanted to talk about and we would go down his list and it may be that this, this business was on it, but I, I'm just morally certain right. that there was no such uh, request of him that I vouch for the activity, nor was there any vouching on my part. All right. Mr. Ehrlichman, I would like to, to conclude, my, and the reason I'm I'm, I'm probing this area with regard to your frame of mind at the time is, is this. It, it appears to me that if the, say, the break-in at the psychiatrist's office uh, of Daniel Ellsberg was a legitimate matter, a matter of concerning national security and was legal under your interpretation of, I presume, the implied powers of the President under the con uh, Constitution, if you felt this way, and if, in fact, the President had instructed you for national security reasons, to see that those matters were not uncovered or exposed in the investigation of the Watergate, then all of these other matters would seem to fall as a matter of course. Uh, that other matters you'll respond to. This business about telling the dean to deep six the, the hunt documents that you're familiar with. The business about uh, uh, seeing that money was raised or helping to see that money was raised to keep the defendants quiet. Uh, this business about offering Hunt executive clemency or the president offering Hunt executive clemency. And I know you want to respond to all of those. But I'm interested in, in how you felt at the time. If, if one, you did feel like it was 
the previous activities of the plumbers were legitimate and legal. And two, the president did give you the instruction which he says he gave you, then would not these matters fall as a matter of course? And would you have any reason to deny them? Mr. Thompson, without getting into all of these specific misstatements of truth, let's look at what I did do when the president gave me the instruction back in the first of 1972 with regard to holding confidential the activities of that special unit. What I did do was to contact the people who were involved, that is, Crow and Young primarily, and say, this is the president's decision. This is his determination. He does not want this talked about. It is confidential. It is secret. It is, it is not to be discussed. Before the Watergate. Oh, yes, six months before. But the point is, I didn't run around trying to bribe anybody. I didn't run around trying to shred documents. I didn't, as a matter of fact, we preserved the documents for historical purposes because this was, a, this was an important interlude, I felt, in the, in the history of this country. Uh, we'd never had such a wholesale uh, 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 raid on the nation's defense secrets as we had in that six-month period. But the problem of exposure of activities, of course, came after the Watergate because of, of the very fact of the Watergate and the pursuant investigation. What did you do after the break-in at the Watergate pursuant to the President's well, instruction? As far as I know, and, and this isn't anything that I particularly did, I'm speaking now of the, of the White House generally, the only thing that was done, if in fact these instructions were given, as I say, they were not given to me, the only thing that I know that was done was that various people were cautioned that this was a top secret subject prior to their giving uh, interviews to the FBI. Now, beyond that, I don't know of anything beyond else that, you that did was done. Else. Sir? You did nothing else to see that uh, these activities were not exposed. I can't think of anything. Thank you, Mr. Ehrlichman. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Now, in, in the interest of expedite matters, and we're going to hold each senator to a first go round to 20 minutes, and I ask Senator Baker to keep time on me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ehrlichman, do I understand that you are testifying that the, the committee to reelect the president and those associated with them constitute an elemocenary institution? that gave $450,000 to some burglars and their lawyers merely because they felt sorry for them? I'm afraid I'm not your best witness on that, Mr. Chairman. I don't know what their motives were. Uh, uh, well, I think those will, those will appear in the, uh, in the course of the proceedings. You stated this was a defense fund, just like that given to Angela Davis and to Daniel Ellsberg, didn't you? I stated that that was my understanding yes. of it. Well, the Daniel Ellsberg and uh, the Angela Davis uh, defense funds were raised in public meetings and the newspapers carried items about it, didn't they? I'm not sure that we know who the donors to those funds were. I, I dare know. say that there are many people in this country who contributed to those funds who wouldn't want it known. Yes, but don't you think most of the people contributed to their funds because they believed in the causes they stood for? I assume that. Well, certainly the, the, the uh, committee to re-elect the president and the White House aides like yourself did not believe in the cause of burglars and wiretappers, did you? No, sir. <laughs> Can you I, didn't, I didn't contribute a nickel, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Well, you, you, you authorized somebody else to contribute them. No, uh, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to set that straight, if I might, Mr. Chairman. The, the only reason that anybody ever came to me about Mr. Kambach raising money was because of this arrangement that we had entered into that we would protect Mr. Kambach if he wished to be protected from requests to raise money. Now, that is a uh, – it was a, a – uh, uh, a situation where obviously he didn't wish to be protected. He made the judgment. He made it independent of me. And whether I consented did, to it or not obviously didn't make did any difference. Did he ever talk to you about this? Not until after the fact. Well, I'll ask you if he didn't come to you and not only talk about having known you a long time and you having known his family, but didn't he ask you whether it was a proper or legal operation? Well, Mr. Chairman, the testimony is at that meeting, according to Mr. Kambach, was the 26th of July, when he was long into this 
And uh, uh, as I've already testified. Yes, he, he testified. He'd become dubious about uh, of the, the propriety of it. And he went to you for reassurance. Well, as I... And as he I, also testified that when he got to you, you told him it was all right and to care, see if the money was delivered in secret because if it didn't deliver it in secret, our, our heads would be in their laps. Now, did that occur? No. As a matter of fact, Mr. Chairman, as I've just told Mr. Thompson, I would be terribly slow to reassure Herb Kambach, whom I consider a good and close friend, of the propriety of any such undertaking, but no. of, of any such undertaking, without checking it first, if he had asked me. And I'm testifying to you, Mr. Chairman, that he did not ask me. Well, you recall his testimony was to the effect that I've given him. Oh, you mean about the, yes. about the head in the, head the, in the head lap the business? Roll. Well, I, I suspect that what was said there was that certainly Mr. Kambach's involvement. I'm in not asking the, about that. My question is, didn't he have a conversation which you told him to do it in secret because otherwise, if it gets out, our heads will roll, be in their lap. Well, I'm trying to answer you, Mr. Chairman. Well, you can answer that, yes or no. I, I have just 20 minutes this time, and I'm on to ask you a question. <laughs> well, I'll put this question to you. Don't you consider that I'm, I'm perfectly willing to answer that one, Mr. Chairman. That question, Mr. Chairman, please. But he goes off and asks, answers something I don't ask him. Yes, but a yes, yeah. and, a yes and no usually calls for an explanation. Well, what is it? Answer yes or no that he had this conversation with Mr. Kambach. I had a conversation with Mr. Kambach, Mr. Chairman, and I have no doubt that we, dis if he says so, that we discussed the question of secrecy, because I do recall his saying that Mr. Ulasiewicz was carrying money back and forth. Now, I had in my mind at that time the realization that this, what I consider to be a legitimate undertaking, could be terribly misconstrued if someone were to impute the efforts of the President's lawyer to this defense fund for Watergate burglars. I mean, there's, there's room for misunderstanding. I think you have stated the misunderstanding very eloquently in your opening question. So that was the reason that uh, they made an arrangement by which a gentleman in California who resided in California would deliver the money in cash and sometimes in laundry bags to an ex-policeman in New York and allow the ex-policeman to come down and deliver the money under orders that he wasn't going to, wasn't to permit the people he delivered it to to see him. Well, Mr. Chairman, as you know, I had nothing to do with those details at all. As a matter of fact, uh, I was quite surprised to learn in the testimony here that there was a uh, what amounted to a laundering process where committee money or money held by people in the committee were passed through several hands and around to Mr. Kambach for eventual uh, delivery. And this, of course, all predated any conversation that Mr. Kambach and I had. Well, I've always thought that if a political institution or committee enacted the role of a eleemosynary institution, it would be like the Pharisee. It would brag about it on all the on all, uh, opportunities. And so you agree with me that a doubting Thomas might think that this uh, money was routed uh, in this clandestine way not only to keep it uh, secret, but also to keep these people that were receiving the money secret. No, I don't agree with that because I don't know that. Uh, I don't, well, I haven't heard I'm anything, about Mr. You. Chairman. I, I doubt and Thomas might reach that very, uh, very erroneous conclusion, might he? Oh, uh, doubting Thomases are known for yes. conclusions like that. Now, let's see. Didn't, didn't you have a phone conversation with this comeback uh, just before he came to Washington to testify before the grand jury about this matter? I believe he was in Washington with his attorneys at the time. Yes. And didn't you bug his telephone conversation with you? No, sir. Didn't you record it then? Yes, sir. Did you tell him in advance? <laughs> You tell me precisely what's the difference between recording a telephone conversation and bugging it. I'd be ha I'm happy to tell you my view of it. Oh, that's what I, I have a I have an ordinary dictating machine in my or did have in my office, 
that had a knob on it that evidently was put there by the factory at the, at the company when they made it. And all that's necessary for me to do to cause the telephone conversation to go on to the dictabelt, which otherwise I would use to dictate letters, would be to turn that little knob. Now, as I understand the bug, that's the kind of thing that you had Mr. McCord and others in here showing you that go inside of telephones and are, are uh, uh, something that are not exactly factory models. Yeah, well, I have about 15 telephones, and none of them came with any kind of machine like that on them. <laughs> and I haven't put any on them either. I think the result is about the same as having your secretary listen in on the other line and take it down in shorthand. Mm -hmm. Yes, but you didn't tell Mr. Comback that you were uh, recording his uh, conversation. Did you? Sir? No, you, nor, no, did, no. nor oh. did he tell me that he had two lawyers in the room with him. Yeah. <laughs> well, you uh, see no difference between a man that's going for the grand jury having uh, two lawyers and a man who's having uh, a recording or bugging this one next to his telephone? Well, I take exception to bugging because I think that's no. a, an unfair characterization, well, Mr. Chairman. Well, recording. I'll give you the polite uh, euphemism. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now, on this uh, recording... Mr. Comback said, you know, when you and I talked, and it, was after, and it was after John had given me the word, and I came to ask you, John, is this an assignment I have to take on? You said, yes, it is, period, and move forward. Then that was all that I needed to be assured that I wasn't putting my family in jeopardy. Now, didn't, uh, didn't uh, come back make that statement to you in the telephone uh, conversation uh, the day before he uh, became uh, test testified for the grand jury and, and was recorded on this estimate next to your telephone? Uh, could I see what you're looking at, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Page okay. three. Uh, I'm not sure I have a copy of what you have there. Well. Uh, I don't know whether yours was transcribed from the belt or uh, how, what the source of it was, but I would like to compare what you have, if you don't mind. Well, this, uh, this is the uh, transcript received from uh, your attorney on subpoena, so I take it it's the same thing you have. Uh, Mr. You, Chairman, uh, may I ask Mr. Dash, did you get that from the U.S. Attorney's Office or from us? No, no, from you. Page three, the, top, the first you. question on top of page three. Yes, I think that was in response to the statement that I made at the bottom of page two, Mr. Chairman, in which okay. I make clear that Mr. Dean came to me, as I've testified here, and asked me to vouch for him without giving me any specifics. Well, this is not about the conversation between you and Mr. Dean. This is a conversation between uh, Mr. Comback and you. Well, that's what I just... And he asked you specifically. He said, uh, said you know, when I, you and I talked, and it was after John, which I presume is John Dean, had given me that word, and I came in to ask you, John... I interpret that to be John Erdman. Is this an assignment I have to take on? You said yes. It is. Yes, it is, period, and move forward. Then that was all that I needed to be assured that I wasn't putting my family in jeopardy, and your answer is sure. Yeah, but my question is also important because his the statement well, you just read is a response to something that I said at the bottom of page two, sir. No, this word sure is what you said in response to a question put by Comback to you, not uh, anything else. Well, I'd have to disagree with you, Mr. Chairman. I suppose what well, we have to do is take the whole context of what Mr. Comback said in order to understand its meaning. Well, Mr. Ehrlichman, uh, no, I, I can't see what it was. Uh, what the, the context is that I have just said to him at the bottom of page two uh, uh, that John Dean came to me and said this was an yes. urgent matter, and that he gave me no specifics. But this was something that Mitchell had told him was important, and I said to John Dean, well, if you tell me it's that important, why, yes, without having any specifics. And then he goes on and this, this reads, is, he this, goes on and says what you just read. This, you're telling Comback, 
And, and what, then, of course... What Dean said to you and Haldeman. I understand. Yes. And then you've just read me what yes. he told me. Now, you, uh, uh, not a while ago, you gave a comeback in such assurance, didn't you? No, sir. What I, Mr. Thompson asked me and what I denied was this very vivid uh, uh, and, and dramatic moment when we looked deep, deep into each other's eyes and I said with, with solemn assurance that this was both legal and proper. And I made no such solemn assurance. And as a matter of fact, in what you read here, the word period stands out graphically because period means that was the end of the conversation. And yes. you will notice that there is nothing in there about my assuring Mr. Kambach that this was either proper or legal. Well, now, Mr. Kambach says to you in about as plain a words as can be found in the English language, I came in to, you know, I came in to ask you, John, is this an assignment I have to take on? You said yes, it is, period, and move forward. Yeah, but you have and, to read that, Mr. Then Chairman. You, had, you have to read that in the context of the previous comment, which I just referred to, in I which I vouch that the urgency of this matter was not anything I knew of my own knowledge, but what Mr. Dean told me on the basis of well, his I'm, conversation with Mr. Did, Mitchell. You, did, you, uh, you told him that this was a peer, uh, assignment he had to take on. Well, obviously, Mr. Chairman, he's not uh, my employee. He's not my vassal. I, I hold no sway over him. Uh, it, it was very much a situation where Mr. Kambach undertook this, and you'll recall he undertook it some six weeks before we had this conversation. Well, I, I thought uh, he said he'd been on it a few days, a few weeks, yes. But he went on with it after this, and he says he went on with it solely because you gave him this assurance which appears hell, except he put it more dramatic. No, sir. No, sir. He went on with it, according to his testimony, if I may respectfully disagree, because of assurances I gave him about the propriety and legality of it, well, which I assure you did not happen, and which this conversation, I think, indicates did not well, happen. Mr. Mr. Artigman, what did you say when Mr. Comback asked you, in this uh, telephone conversation, which you recorded unbeknownst to him, when he asked you, you know, and I came to ask you, John, is this an assignment that I have to take on? What I said to him, Mr. Chairman, in addition to the word sure, was the material that I just referred to at the bottom of page two that you apparently don't feel is in this context, but I do. He didn't come to you. He said he didn't come to you. He'd gotten dubious about Dean, and that's the reason he came to you. And you told him, hell, that uh, this was an assignment he should take on. But I did it in terms of the context, which well, is at the bottom of page Mr. two, Mr. Chairman, where I say Mr. Dean came to me and gave me that assurance, and I have made no independent inquiry, and he was doing so because of the urgency stated by Mr. Mitchell. And it has to be taken in so that context, that time, Mr. Chairman, or it isn't meaningful. So at that time, you relied implicitly on Dean. Yes, sir. And now you don't trust him. Sir, that's correct. Yeah. And uh, I, I dare say that the dawn broke somewhere toward the end of March of this year. Well, let's go on to something else. You said something about uh, the uh, burglarizing of the office of the psychiatrist of Ellsberg was justified by the president's inherent power under the Constitution, didn't you? Yes, sir. And you referred to a certain statute. I referred to a statute in which the Congress in 1968 made recognition of that inherent power. Is that 18 United States Code 2511? Yes, sir. Will you please, please tell me that, that now this statute has nothing to do with burglary. It only has to do... has to do with the United with States Constitution, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. Chairman. No, sir. Not the purpose of the statute. The Constitution takes care of itself even though the statute sets it out. This statute has only to do with the interception or disclosure of wire or oil communications prohibited. No, sir, it also has to do with the Congress recognition of what the Constitution provides is with it, relation to the is powers this, of the President. Is there a single thing in there that says that, uh, that the President can authorize burglaries? Well, let's, let's read it, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, this being, this being a legal point, don't you think that maybe you and I should debate this? No, I think he's a lawyer. He was counsel to the president. Oh, not, not for a long time, Mr. Chairman. I've been out of the law business now for several years. Well, first, why don't we read the statute? Yes, I'll read the statute. It's pretty long. I can ask about it without reading it because it just got 20 minutes and a little of that left. It says here that this statute, which makes it unlawful 
to intercept and disclose wire or other communications says that, that this shall not interfere with the constitutional power of the president to uh, do anything necessary. To, necessary to protect the country against five things. Yes, sir. The first says actual or potential attack or other hostile acts of a foreign power. You well, don't claim that uh, let's get down to the uh, Dr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to get his re opinion, his recorded opinion of uh, the uh, intellectual or psychological state of his patients is an attack by foreign powers, do you? Well, we, we, could, we, could have Chairman, a, we could have a lot of fun with all may I, may four I of these until we get to the operative one, Mr. Chairman. May I get into this? May I get into this legal debate? I, I, what, well, yes, you, you claim that, uh, Mr. Wilson. Then, 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 then you read the, this end of that sentence, which says, or to protect national security information against foreign intelligence uh, activities. Against, against foreign intelligence activities. The foreign intelligence activities was not, had nothing to do with the, the, the opinion of uh, Ellsberg's psychiatrist about his intellectual or emotional or psychological state. How do you know that, Mr. Chairman? Because I can understand the English language as my mother tongue. A telephone conversation which you recorded unbeknownst to him when he asked you, you know, and I came to ask you, John, is this an assignment that I have to take on? What I said to him, Mr. Chairman, in addition to the word sure, was the material that I just referred to at the bottom of page two that you apparently don't feel is in this context, but I do. He didn't come to you he said he didn't come to you. He'd gotten dubious about Dean, and that's the reason he came to you. And you told him, hell, that uh, this was an assignment he should take on. But I did it in terms of the context, which well, is at the bottom of page Mr. two, Mr. Chairman, where I say Mr. Dean came to me and gave me that assurance, and I have made no independent inquiry, and he was doing so because of the urgency stated by Mr. Mitchell. And it has to be taken in so that context, that time, Mr. Chairman, or it isn't meaningful. So at that time, you relied implicitly on Dean. Yes, sir. And now you don't trust him. Sir, that's correct. Well. And uh, I, I dare say that the dawn broke somewhere toward the end of March of this year. Well, let's go on to something else. You said something about... Uh, the uh, burglarizing of the office of the psychiatrist of Ellsberg was justified by the president's inherent power under the Constitution, didn't you? Yes, sir. And you referred to a certain statute. I referred to a statute in which the Congress in 1968 made recognition of that inherent power. Is that uh, 18 United States Code 2511? Yes, sir. Will you please, please tell me that, that now this statute has nothing to do with burglary? 
It only has to do with the United with States interception. Constitution, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. Chairman. Also, not the purpose of the statute. The Constitution takes care of itself, even though the statute sets out. This statute has only to do with the interception or disclosure of wire or oil communications prohibited. No, sir, it also has to do with the Congress' recognition of what the Constitution provides there, with relation to the powers there, of the President. Is there a single thing in there that says that, uh, that the President cannot authorize burglaries? Well, let's, let's read it, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, this being, this being a legal point, don't you think that maybe you and I should debate this? No, I think he's a lawyer. He was counsel to the president. Oh, not, to... not for a long time, Mr. Chairman. I've been out of the law business now for several years. Well, first, why don't we read the statute? Yes, I'll read the statute. It's pretty long. I can ask about it without reading it because it just got 20 minutes and a little of that left. It says here that this statute, which makes it unlawful to intercept and disclose wire or other communications, says that, that this shall not interfere with the constitutional power of the president to uh, do anything necessary. Necessary to protect the country against five things. Yes, sir. The first says actual or potential attack or other hostile acts of a foreign power. You don't claim that uh, Let's get down burglarizing to uh, Dr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to get his opinion, his recorded opinion of uh, the uh, intellectual or psychological state of his patients is an attack by foreign power studio. Well, we, we, could, we, could have a, we could have a lot of fun with all I, four of these until we get to the operative one, Mr. Chairman. May I get into this? May I get into this legal debate? I, I, what, well, yes, you, you claim that, uh, Mr. Wilson. Then... then then, then you read the, this end of that sentence, which says, or to protect national security information against foreign intelligence against, activities. Against foreign intelligence activities. The foreign intelligence activities was not, had nothing to do with the, the, the opinion of Ellsberg's psychiatrist about his intellectual or emotional or psychological state. How do you know that, Mr. Chairman? Because I can understand the English languages from Mother Tongue. <laughs> Chairman, may I answer that? Well, if you want to be a witness, Mr. Wilson, yes. I'll be glad to be sworn. Oh, I don't care if you be sworn. <laughs> the CIA must have thought that it had some foreign relationship because they had done an un uh, ineffective profile on Ellsberg. Well, the CIA had no business doing that because the law prohibits them from having anything to do with internal security. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, sir, you wouldn't consider that uh, foreign intelligence activity as a uh, No, this was a domestic intelligence activity. These people were from the from the Plumas, from the White House. Yes, yes but the, the, we had we had a man passing secrets to the Soviet government. Well, the Ellsberg's psychiatrist wasn't doing that. <laughs> of course, that's that's just All the point, I can Mr. Say Chairman. To you is why did the CIA want to do a profile on? Because. On I'm going to say, I'm going to give her that because uh, the CIA in my book has nothing to do with bugging the psychiatrist's office in the United States to find out what the emotional or psychological or intellectual state of an American is. Well, Mr. Now, Chairman, would you let a layman uh, respond to this uh, well, just very briefly? Would, yes, I was trying to question you, but your lawyer didn't seem to want me to do it. Well, I think that's... Uh, I think that's a, a, a broadly held view in the legal profession these days. Uh, I think that, that basically you have to take this in context. We had here uh, an unknown quantity in terms of a conspiracy. We had an overt act in the turning over of these secret documents to the, to the Russian embassy. And, and moreover, we have a technique here in the development of a psychiatric profile, which apparently, in the opinion of the experts, is so valuable that the CIA maintains an entire psychiatric section for that purpose. Now, uh, putting those all together, I submit that certainly there is, 
there is in 2511 ample congressional recognition of the President's inherent constitutional powers to form a foundation for what I said to this committee. Well, Mr. Arnold, the Constitution specifies the President's powers to me, and uh, the Fourth Amendment says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the personal things to be seized. I think Spring that does, there's nowhere in this instrument that says the President has a right to suspend the Fourth Amendment. No, I think the Supreme Court has said that the search or seizure or whatever it is has to be reasonable, and they've said that a national security undertaking can be reasonable well, and can very nicely comply with the, with the well, Fourth Amendment. But, Mr. Chairman, the Congress in 1968 has said this. Nothing contained in this chapter or in Section 605 of the Communications Act and so forth shall limit the constitutional power of the President to take such measures as he deems necessary to protect the nation against, and then it goes on, to protect national security information against foreign intelligence activities. Now, that is precisely what the President was undertaking. He was not undertaking it under this statute. He was undertaking it under that constitutional power which you gentlemen and the other members of the Congress recognized in yes, the statute. Yes, I have called that statute. I'm familiar with that statute. And there's not a syllable in there that says the President can suspend the Fourth Amendment or authorize burglary. It has no reference to burglary. It has reference only to interception and disclosure of wire, intercept of, of, of wire or oral communications. Now, when did you learn about uh, the fact that uh, two people employed by the, the White House, Liddy and Hunt, had uh, burglarized the office of uh, Ellsberg's psychiatry, psychiatrist? I believe it was either the day after or two days after I returned from uh, a vacation at Cape Cod, which would have put it one or two days after Labor Day of 19... 1971. 1971? Yes, sir. And so you hunt a, an accessory before the fact to the felony of burglary, was kept on the White House payroll, and given an office in the executive office building, to your knowledge, for about to come out to the break in of the Watergate. Well, Mr. Chairman, I can't adopt the various assumptions of your question with regard to the criminality of the act and so forth. My uh, advice at that time was that both Hunt and Liddy had acted pursuant to an authorization. And uh, uh, taking into account the... the uh, an authorization from whom? Well, I assumed from Mr. Crow. Well, who, Mr. Crow, I believe, got his authorizations from you, didn't he? Well, uh, not as far as I know he did. No, sir. Well, he's under your supervision. He was, he was generally under my supervision and the domestic council staff as a, as a routine Mr. proposition. Mr. Erdogan, you're a lawyer and you know that uh, a psychiatrist is forbidden to divulge the information about his patients, don't you? Without his patients' well, consent. I think it, if we're going to, it, yeah, I think if we're going to split hairs, it would be well, under circumstances either that's of a... That's a Hippocratic oath which started back in ancient Greece, Greece, and been growing ever since. I'm not sure that psychiatrists in every case are MDs, but let's assume that for the sake of argument. Uh, the fact is, as I stated before earlier, uh, my assumption is that it is possible to get specific medical and other kinds of confidential information through a trained investigator, if he knows what he's looking for, without a violation Mr. of law. Mr. Arlington, you're a lawyer, and you know that a psychiatrist is forbidden by law to divulge the confidential in information he gets from his client, his, his patient, on examination of the patient, to make a diagnosis without his client's consent. 
Now, don't you know that? I didn't know that was a matter of law. I know there's a privilege that exists as a matter of law. Why, don't but you, I don't know that it's a criminal you know violation. That, don't you I, know? I may well be. I just didn't know. Don't you know there's a statute to that effect in every state in this union, and the only statutes that make an exception to that is a judge in a court can require the, the physician or the psychiatrist to testify about his patient if he finds it's in the interest of justice? No, I didn't know that, Mr. Chairman. And yet you advise it to the President of the United States. Well, I dare it. say there, there are a lot of things that I don't know, Mr. Chairman. Well, if you'd known the law, I would just submit that in all probability you would also have known that the only way you could get the, the, uh, the, the opinion of the psychiatrist, Ellsberg psychiatrist, was by some surreptitious manner in some surreptitious fashion. No, I don't, I, I, I don't know what you mean by surreptitious, Mr. Chairman. I do know this from experience, that information of this kind is obtainable. You, you, you mean, Insurance adjusters obtain yes, it, right. investigators obtain it, attorneys obtain it, and they obtain it through nurses, through nurses' aides, through all kinds of sources. And uh, it's, it's, we'd be kidding ourselves if we didn't, if we didn't you don't know what that. You don't know what the word surreptitious means? Well, I don't know what you meant by it in that question, Mr. Chairman. Really? That can't you? Don't you know? Really? Oh, I know the word. <laughs> You were using well, it in a pejorative sense, Mr. Oh, Chairman, and they, I wasn't just sure how. They, they, some people do things in illegal fashions and obtain information in illegal fashions. But I would assert as a lawyer that when you go to get in the record of a patient, a, 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 a lawyer's opinion of his patient, his recorded record opinion, that uh, you cannot get it legally without the consent of the patient or without an order of a judge. And the only other way you can get it is an illegal or unethical way. I've taken more than 20 minutes. Mr. Chairman, I've got to confess I didn't have the courage to cut you off for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but I also have to confess that you're the only man I ever saw who can read the transcript of a telephone conversation too well. And it was after John had given me the word. And I came in and asked and said, John, is this my assignment? And make it sound like the New Testament. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, it's 10 minutes to 5 in the afternoon. And I'm sure in the allocation of 20 minutes that are given to me that we won't cover all the material that we could cover. We may not cover all the questions that I'd like to ask. But I'd like to try to avoid a repetition of the points that have been put to you. I'd like to avoid, if I can, as much of the detail that is used to test your evidence, your testimony against that of other witnesses, which is a standard and traditional legal tool and technique, and go to a couple of fundamental considerations to wit. Did you know, on or prior to June 17, 1972, that there was planned and would be, and that there would be executed a covert entry into the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate complex in Washington? No, I didn't, sir. Did you have any information that you have later recognized as an indication that that was about to occur? No, sir. When did you first learn of the break-in? On the day following the break-in, when I received this telephone call toward dusk late in the afternoon. From whom? From Mr. Boggs of the Secret Service. And I know this is somewhat repetitious, but tell us again, for the sake of sequence, what Mr. Boggs told you. Well, briefly, he said that he had had a report from the Metropolitan Police Department about this incident because uh, some of the people who had been picked up one of them had in his possession the name of someone who apparently was a White House employee, and that was Howard Hunt. What was your reaction to that? Uh, I asked him a little bit about the circumstances, uh, when it had happened, uh, how many people were involved, uh, whether anybody from the White House was directly involved, this kind of thing, and thanked him very much. What did he say? He said that uh, as far as he knew, that was the only connection with the White House, 
It was just the possession of this fellow's name, and uh, he told me that five people had been caught red-handed uh, uh, burglarizing the Democratic National. Did he tell you the names of the five people? He may have, but it didn't didn't mean anything to me. What did you do with the information? I made a phone. I made two phone calls. I called uh, Ron Ziegler, the press secretary who was with the president in Florida, and told him about that te telephone call because I thought he might be getting some inquiries or would want to make some inquiries. Is that the first call you made? I think it is, although it, it, it may have been in reverse order. I also called Mr. Colson to find out whether Howard Hunt still was employed at the White House. And I'm not sure whether I did that in response to a question from Mr. Ziegler or not. Uh, but it, it was both were in, in rapid sequence. Did you call anyone else except Mr. Ziegler and Mr. Colson on June 17th? Not that I can recall. Mr. Caulfield testified here that he called me, and he may have. I, uh, I don't have a specific recollection of the phone call, but if he did, it was after the call from Mr. Bob. Did anyone else call you on June 17th? I, I believe not. So the sum total of your information was a call from Mr. Boggs of the Secret Service, and the sum total of your activity was to call Mr. Ziegler and Mr. Coles. Right. Did you read the newspaper accounts of the break-in? Yes, sir. Did you gain additional information from the newspaper accounts? Yes. I what, learned what that, information? Well, I learned, for instance, that one of the people apprehended was uh, an employee of the uh, uh, re-election committee, and I don't think that Mr. Boggs had told me that the previous previous evening. Did now, I may, have, I may have seen it on the news, come to think of it, that night. I may have watched the television news. Did you talk to the President on the 17th? No, I didn't. Not that I can recall. Did you talk to Mr. Haldeman on the 17th? I think I talked to him the following day. Well, let's limit it to the 17th just right. for the moment. Did you talk to Mr. Dean on the 17th? No. Mr. Mitchell? I don't believe so. Mr. Uh, Gray? I've heard testimony here that I did. I can't recall a conversation with Mr. Mitchell. Were you concerned about it? Not, not particularly. All right, move on then to the 18th. Who did you talk to? Who talked to you? What additional information did you receive and what action did you take? And if you don't mind, Mr. Ehrlichman, as briefly as possible, outline for me the steps that you took, the information you received, the general state of circumstances from your first information on June 17th, 1972, for a few days thereafter. The 18th was Sunday. I believe I talked to Mr. Haldeman on the telephone about this. I think that we, the purpose of our call was really something else, uh, some, other, some other business item. And we discussed the fact of the break-in and the fact of Hunt's name being involved and McCord being involved and so forth. He told me something about the statement which the Committee to Re-elect People were putting out uh, that day or the next day, I forget which, but I, I do recall we discussed the, the public statement that was going to be made on this. On the 19th, uh, which was Monday, uh, wait a minute, just, just a second. Yes, Still sir. on the 18th in your call with Mr. Haldeman. Mr. Haldeman was, in effect, the President's Chief of Staff. I yes, sir. Understand. Was there any conversation between you and Mr. Haldeman about how unfortunate or incredible or how dangerous this was? Was there anything other than a calm, ordinary exchange of no, information? No, I think, I think both of us wondered why in the world anybody would want to break in there. Uh, that was at the, the depths of the, the Democrats' fortunes. Uh, I don't think anybody believed that, that anybody in that particular office knew anything that was worth knowing. Did you ask Mr. Haldeman if he discussed this with the President? Uh, no, I didn't. Did you ask him if it had been brought to his attention or if the President knew about it? No, I'm, I'm quite sure I did. Uh, that is not something that I would ordinarily put in that way to well, Mr. Did you Holmes. put it in any way that no, involved I don't, the President? No, I don't, I don't believe so. Uh, my assumption is that uh, news of that kind gets to the President. Uh, well, did you ask what with. the President thought about it, if you assume that? No. All right, sir, no. go ahead. Uh, I don't think I did anything else with relation to this subject matter on that Sunday. I, at least I can't recall doing it. On Monday, uh, I had a meeting with John Dean uh, midday, and we discussed this in, in really in terms of two aspects. One was the White House involvement question, and I asked him to see if he could get it solved in short order. That is, was Hunt a White House employee or not? What was his status and so forth? 
because that was still that was still lingering as a as an open question. Secondly, it was obvious that this was going to be a campaign issue, and I was concerned about knowing everything that I could know, so that when Ron Ziegler and the presidential party got back to town, uh, we would be in shape to sit down and talk about its implications in in terms of its being a political issue. Mr. Ehrlichman, it occurs to me, and I may be entirely wrong, but it occurs to me that if someone on my staff, even remotely on my staff, were charged with breaking and entering to the Democratic National Committee headquarters, or someone was even associated with it in a newspaper column, that I would be determined to find out if that happened. Now, was there this air of urgency in the White House on your part, or Haldeman's part, or Dean's part? It's not coming through that way. It sounds like a, a routine staff operation, but this wasn't a routine staff operation. Uh, Point one, he wasn't on my staff, uh, but that's, that's beside the point. I think there was a, a sense of the political implications of this thing. It was, a, it was a dumb, shocking, unredeemable kind of thing for people connected with the committee to reelect to have done to the Democrats. There isn't any, any way of, of uh, glossing it. And uh, certainly, the Democrats were going to exploit this if they possibly could. The fact that there might be a White House connection was really the central, the central problem in this, as far as I was concerned. When did you first learn that this was uh, orchestrated by uh, people who were connected with the CRP? Well, McCord was in it right from the first minute. And I, I'm sure I learned of that connection uh, on the evening news or some way, uh, so that I, I knew right from the first day that there was a literally a CRP employee involved in this thing. Well, when did you find out that it was more than just a CRP employee? I don't think that I, well, and, and of course Boggs's call said hunt, hunt with a White House designation on the slip or the card or whatever it was. So there was that, there was that warning light on right from that moment. I don't think I knew about Liddy and, and his involvement until after Dean reported back uh, late on the, on the 19th or early on the 20th. Something what did that Mr. Time. Dean report to you? He reported to me that uh, he had, uh, I, should, I should go back uh, to what I asked him to do, and I guess I'm pretty well finished with that. I, I expressed my concerns on, on these two fronts. And when he came back, he said he had talked to Liddy and that he had also talked to the uh, people at the Justice Department or the Police Department or somewhere and, and uh, uh, had a feel for this thing. And he said uh, the Justice Department or <coughs> the law enforcement people anyway were aware that this matter went beyond just the, the five fellows who were caught and that Liddy was involved and it was just a matter of time before he'd be picked up and that uh, uh, there was uh, further direct involvement of the CRP. All right, now that was on what, the 19th of June? I believe it was either the, the close of business the 19th or the next day. Stop at that point, Mr. Ehrlichman. Let's explore, as the saying goes in this committee, that point in time. Let's, let's see what you did with that information. At that point, John Dean, who was counsel to the president, indicated to you that Liddy was involved, that others with the CRP were involved, that it would be just a matter of time before others were picked up and implicated, and broadly implied, based on your testimony just now, that the CRP was deeply involved in this situation. What did you do with that information? Did you pick up the telephone and call the president? Did you call Haldeman? What did you do with it? Well, I think by that time, uh, the president and the, and the traveling party were on their way back. Uh, I believe that this meeting that was held on Tuesday morning was held at my instance, and it involved uh, Mr. Mitchell, the Attorney General, uh, Mr. Haldeman and me, and John Dean. And this was for the purpose of gathering as much information as possible at the, at the top levels and seeing what ought to proceed from that, what next step ought to be taken from that point forward. Take the one part of my question that I put in several parts. Did any of you call the president or convey to the president the information that Liddy and others 
involved with the CRP were going to be involved and identified with the break-in to the Democratic National Headquarters. I did not, Senator. I'm not sure whether this was uh, imparted to the President by anybody else. Well, Mr. Ehrlichman, to pursue that point just one step further, did you then know or have you since learned that as of June 19, 1972, someone did impart that information to the President. That is, that Liddy, McCord, Hunt, and others with the CRP were involved in the break-in. I, I don't know that, of my own knowledge. Have you since learned that? No, as I say, I have not, I don't have that knowledge. What I'm really driving for is the question I've put before, Mr. Ehrlichman, and I don't mean it to be an accusatory question. It's really a question calculated to produce relevant information. When did the President first know of CRP involvement in the break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters? Well, I'm, I'm willing to speculate on that, Senator. Sir? I say I'm willing to speculate on that. Well, I don't want you to. You can if you like. But uh, what I'm after is what you knew then or what you've later learned uh, about when the President knew. I'm, I'm not your best witness because of the fact that the President was out of town at the time and I was here. But my hunch is that over the weekend, uh, Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ziegler, uh, as they routinely do, passed along the developing information uh, on this matter. And you don't have any later acquired information that confirms that hunch? I, I, I don't think I do. I don't think I've ever asked. Now, you what, met, you that met that with the President then on the following day, on the 20th of June, I understand. Yes, sir. Now, what additional information did you have on the 20th of June? I'm not sure I had very much. I think that the... Um, uh, headlines uh, on that day were uh, featuring Mr. Hunt. The uh, Democrats filed their lawsuit that day, and uh, the, the, it was a very it was a very muddled picture, and it remained a muddled picture as to what really happened and who was responsible, and that and the CIA thing was beginning to be talked about around. These, these uh, uh, four uh, defendants were identified as having had CIA ties. And uh, frankly, I don't think anybody felt very confident of the information that they were beginning to acquire. But in any event, you met with the President at some time on June 20th, according to the log we have, at 10.30 in the morning. Does that correspond with your recollection or your records? Uh, that corresponds with my log, yes, sir. Uh, before I ask you the next question, describe for me the atmosphere, describe for me the attitude at the White House at this time. We're now three days beyond the arrest of the Watergate burglars. We're now uh, at a place where there have been extensive newspaper accounts and television coverage. There's been an identification of major figures in the committee to reelect the president and their involvement. There have been arrests. There's been a civil lawsuit for the Democratic National Committee against the Republican National Committee, or CRP, rather, not against the RNC. There have been really stupendous developments when you consider them in the context of an ongoing presidential campaign. And you meet with the President at 10.30 in the morning, three days later. Now, tell me what you discussed with the President about the Watergate. Well, I don't think we discussed very much, Senator, well, and that's met, a, that may seem to be a... 55 minutes, Mr. That's, a, that's an added climax after the buildup of your question. But the, the fact is that at that particular point in time, there was not a whole lot certain. We can look back now through the, through the telescope of hindsight and see a number of things that must have been apparent on the landscape. But what we really had for certain at that time was a kind of a of a lingering uh, concern because we didn't know all the story. We couldn't pin down all the corners. You knew that Liddy was involved. Yes, sir, but we didn't know where this hunt trail led, for instance. And you knew that Liddy was general counsel for the CRP. And, and as far as, uh, I'll tell you my frame of mind, as far as I was concerned, if the trail led to the CRP, that was a manageable political problem. If the trail, on the other hand, led into the White House, then that was a much more critical political problem. Well, and it was, me, right. and, and I was actively concerned at that point in time because we couldn't pin that down. And there were all kinds of suspicions, and there was, there was a lot of concern that maybe that's where that trail led. 
And, and your testimony is that during that 55-minute conversation beginning at 10.30 in the morning on June 20th, 1972, that you and the President did not discuss Watergate. Well, I, I don't have any record in my notes of that conversation. Do you have any of recollection our, of it? Of our having done so, and I have no independent recollection. And I don't, I don't think that's altogether unreasonable. There was not anything for sure that I was in a position to add to what was in his exhaustive news summary on his desk when he got to work that morning. At the same time, we had had a meeting that morning of Mr. Mitchell and the Attorney General and Mr. Dean and Mr. Haldeman, where we pretty much compared ignorances about this thing and agreed to, uh, uh, to part company and try and develop additional information. Now, when I met with the President, it was for a specific purpose. I was about to come up to, to Congress to call on some members of Congress, some senators, to talk about legislation. And I needed some decisions and some marching orders from the President on that particular subject. And that was something that we could, that, that we could handle in that time frame. Mr. Irvin, do I understand that you did not know that tape recordings were being made of presidential conversations at the White House during this period? That's true and that you since have learned that that is the case? I have. In the meeting with the President, was anyone present other than you and the President? Not according to my log. You have, where was the meeting held? In his office. In the EOB or uh, in the Oval Office? I would have to, I would would have to check Would it have been in one or the other? It would be one or the other. Do you have any reason to believe that that conversation would not be uh, recorded on those tapes? I have no way of knowing, Senator. I think I saw you on television the other day in an interview say that you hoped or you thought the President ought to release those tapes. You think that the access to those tapes for this committee would aid and assist in an evaluation of this testimony? I, uh, I don't know, Senator. I, I don't know what you saw on television. I didn't see that show. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I just gave it uh, what I intended to say. Well, it's double jeopardy to have to I, do it and see it. You know, you don't have what to I do intended both. to say was that as far as I am personally concerned, uh, I would have no objection because I have anything to worry about in terms of what's liable to be in them in, in, in this setting. Now, uh, the President has much heavier concerns and obviously a much broader uh, area of responsibility. I'm just looking at it from my own narrow personal standpoint. And Mr. he's got Edmund. to call this from the standpoint of the President. Thank you very much. It's, my time has almost expired, and there's a vote signal on the clock. I want to ask you one last question, if I may, and I'll reserve the balance of my questions till I have another opportunity. Is there the slightest doubt in your mind that as of that meeting with the President on June 20th, 1972, Based on your knowledge of the newspaper accounts, the television coverage, and your understanding of the White House staff procedures whereby the President was briefed on current affairs through a compilation of press dispatches, the supplying of newspapers, magazines, periodicals, and the like, is there the slightest doubt in your mind that the President on June 20th, 1972, did not know that major and, and significant officers and employees of the CRP had been apprehended in connect connection with the surreptitious entry into the Democratic National Committee headquarters? I, I don't know about major officers, I, uh, because I don't know whether he knew about Liddy at that point in time. Well, I'm McCord, sure he must have known about McCord. McCord was security officer. We're haggling over terms. Sure, but sure. Is there any doubt in your mind that he knew at that no, time? No, no. No doubt. So I'm the answer sure he to did. my question, what did the President know and when did he know it, can be answered in part that he certainly must have known on June 20th that major figures of the CRP were involved. He certainly must have because it was in the news. Now, before I get back to another round of questioning, which will be after my colleagues complete theirs, I want to ask you to search your recollection of memory on any other indications you can give me of presidential information about what he knew, if anything, prior to June 17th or June 20th, 1972. As the chairman pointed out in the lightning bug theorem, sometimes hindsight is better than foresight. I'd like you to examine what you know now as distinguished from what you may have suspected then. I want to know, as best you can help me, what the president knew 
And when did he know? Prior to the 17th of June. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, tomorrow I'll give you, when I, I get another turn, I'll give you an opportunity to tell me why this statute has a slight any relation to this matter. I'm frank to state as a lawyer, I don't think it has any more to do with this than the flowers that bloom in the springtime, but I want to give you an opportunity to convince me of the error of my ways, if they are erroneous. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. I shall take advantage of it. <laughs> <laughs> the committee will stand in recess till uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, unless some member of the committee takes. custom that you are. So the long-anticipated appearance of John Ehrlichman turns out to have been worth waiting for. The former White House domestic chief still has many questions to answer. There are five committee members awaiting their turn, and a second round of questioning is anticipated. Among other things, Ehrlichman suggests that the president has a right to permit whatever acts he deems necessary for national security if some alleged foreign threat can be tied to it. And Ehrlichman says... Presidential approval of such an act makes it legal, however illegal it would be without such sanction. Senator Irvin doesn't go along with that view, and the question, regardless of how peripheral it is to the central Watergate issue, will undoubtedly come in for a lot more discussion. John Kramer of the Georgetown University Law Center and Haynes Johnson, reporter, editor, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist with the Washington Post, watched today's session, John Ehrlichman's first day, uh, before this Senate Watergate Committee. In your opinion, Mr. Johnson, what's the meaning of what we learned or didn't learn from Mr. Ehrlichman today? Well, Jim, I don't think we got any great clarifying revelations out of today's testimony. What we got to me, it seems to me, is some very interesting atmospherics, on which goes right to the heart of what Watergate really is. It is an attitude, after all, not just a series of isolated uh, uh, criminal activities. And, and uh, I think Mr. Ehrlichman touched on that in his opening statement, and it kept coming out throughout the day. And that is uh, that this administration felt itself besieged from within and without, uh, that it had to take certain activities to preserve plug leaks, uh, so, uh, ensure the security of the country. We heard a lot about national security. It's the defense the president has been making, uh, particularly in his May 22nd statement. I think in the sense of giving illumination to the, the attitudes that produced Watergate, that, uh, that helped led to the cover-up, uh, and why we're here in this, this really critical confrontation between the two branches of government, the legislative and the executive, it was illuminating. It has not answered the final questions by any means. We have far more to go on this, and Mr. Ehrlichman, of course, has much more to say. He hasn't been asked many key questions yet. That's true, is it not, John Kramer? I mean, there's many, many things, many more things to go over with him. No, I think there are a good two or three days' worth left just among the issues that have not really been touched at all in either examination or, if you will, cross-examination, when did Ehrlichman really learn about the meetings that Liddy had with Mitchell and Magruder that led to the Watergate break-in? Did Ehrlichman, in fact, tell Dean to call Liddy to order Hunt out of the country on the 20th of June? Did Ehrlichman order Dean to deep-six the contents of Hunt's safe? Nobody's asked about that. What about Peterson and Stans when they tried to get Stans to avoid going before the grand jury? What about the executive clemency conversations with Coulson and Ehrlichman on the 3rd and 4th of January of 1973? What happened in the La Costa meetings? What happened in the whole series of meetings with the president during March and April of this year? And finally, what about Dean's investigation, which Ehrlichman claims to know a lot about? And Ehrlichman also gave a teaser. Why didn't the president fire Dean? Apparently, there's some secret there that we don't know about that Ehrlichman at least said he was going to reveal and hasn't touched on yet. So there's an awful lot to come to come yet. Haynes, let me ask you this question. I uh, was particularly struck uh, by the last two or three witnesses, including Ehrlichman. Uh, Ehrlichman's testimony disputes uh, not only some of the prior witnesses and in, in some uh, detail even disputes some of the things that the president has said. Uh, Martian came on, and he disputed a lot of prior testimony. Uh, Mitchell did the same thing. Yeah, I'm getting the impression that there, nobody's in collusion in this. It is, it's just every man for himself. Is that correct? Well, you know, Jim, there was that one marvelous scene toward the end of the hearings where uh, Mr. Ehrlichman described a meeting uh, on June 20th, he, or, or the 19th or 20th, I don't remember exactly what day it was, right after the break-in, any of that. And here we have Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Haldeman, uh, Mr. Dean, I believe, was there, uh, John Ehrlichman and the rest, and they all profess not to know anything about it. And yet we now know that independently, each one of them knew something. 
But here they sat down in the meetings right together at the time, and, and if, we're, if we're to believe all this testimony, each one is operating in a vacuum somehow. They said, he said, in fact, they compared their ignorances. Compared their ignorances, that's right. Yeah. And, and there is an interesting thread through all of this, this long, long hearings that we're going through, and that is the point that nobody really wants to know whether they had knowledge or not, they don't want to be told about it. Uh, you know, at, uh, at some point, uh, Mr. Colson, who hasn't testified yet, has said uh, that uh, when Mr. Hunt came to him, he said, I don't want to know about that. Uh, I think they were talking about the Ellsberg break-in at that time. Uh, we've had a number of these sort of, and, and Mr. Ehrlichman has said, I don't want to know about this. Uh, he hasn't testified that yet. He said that in other, other uh, forums. Uh, there is that attitude, uh, don't bother me. Let these things work their way out, and if I know... I don't want to be careful about this, uh, whether they want to be implicated or not, but the, don't tell me too much. Mm -hmm. Just let it work its way out. You know, I was fascinated by uh, that whole line of questioning by Fred Thompson uh, as to whether the president instructed John Ehrlichman uh, to keep the, yes. the uh, plumber's activities under wraps, and uh, Ehrlichman said, no, he never was really instructed to do that. And... Uh, what, did that strike you all as, as rather unusual uh, for him to take that position? Yeah, I was startled by the fact that at least twice that was one of the mm -hmm. major points. He seemed to contradict the president because the president two or three times in his May 22nd statement said he did give instructions specifically about being careful about the plumbers and being careful about any other CIA involvement. And Ehrlichman said that was back in January and not at all in June. Yeah, the second time there was a contradiction was over whether or not the Ellsberg break-in is in fact a violation of... Uh, of the law. The president says, yes, indeed it is. Mr. Ehrlichman is not ready to concede that and takes the higher law of the president's inherent powers to try to overcome And that. we saw Sam Irvin also uh, disagrees with Mr. Ehrlichman on that in addition to the president. Yes, yes and that has challenged his lawyer to come up and uh, talk to him tomorrow on, on tomorrow's hearings. I was struck there were two other things in today's hearings that seemed to me that were significant. One was that uh, uh, Ehrlichman testified that in August he told President Nixon of the possible involvement of Mr. Magruder. That we haven't heard before, a direct meeting with the president. And the second one, which is even more uh, interesting in view of Mr. Nixon's statement, is that he had told the president in March uh, about the Ellsberg uh, Berg, uh, psychiatrist break-in. Now, the president has said in his statement on May 22nd that he learned about it uh, much later than that. And indeed, Middle of April, I believe. And indeed, uh, uh, the testimony of uh, Ehrlichman also was that the prosecutors knew about this and had material on it and... Uh, uh, and that they, but they also, as it was read into the testimony today, uh, did not learn about it until April 18th or 15th, and then passed the word on to the president, who immediately on receiving this, uh, sometime around April 25th, passed the word on to Judge Byrne. Now that, that's that's testimony that we're going to have to have explored at great and, length, and I'm sure we will. And uh, of course, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, I think, has been noted before, was probably the most combative witness uh, yet to become before the before the senators. He came to fight. He came to defend himself. And uh, as the uh, questioning continues tomorrow, it should get even hotter than it was today. Gentlemen, thank you both very much. The day after tomorrow, we'll hear the White House response to the committee's subpoena of presidential tapes. We know the president has said the tapes won't be forthcoming. But the tone of the response explaining why not could determine what the committee does next. It's no big deal, but I'm going to, to close tonight with a little personal prediction. It involves John Ehrlich, but doesn't have anything at all to do with the truthfulness or the possible lack of it concerning his testimony as such.